Good afternoon. Uh, it is afternoon. Today is Thursday, March 21st. Um, we're the Education and Culture Committee. We're here uh, to discuss several items. We have three items on the agenda today. And I'm joined by my colleagues on the committee, Council Members Albernaz and Mink, and we're also joined by Council Members Balcom and Council Member Lukey. And we always like visitors, as I say. Um, and we have three items. We have, we're going to continue and put a bow on, hopefully, the CIP uh, for Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, and then we'll talk about the CIP and finish up with Wheaton Arts and Cultural Center. And then f our third item is Montgomery College enrollment update. Uh, so we're going to start with the CIP. And just want to remind, uh, I want to thank uh, our staff, Ms. McGuire, Mr. Levchenko, for all the work, and I know the work continues, but the work up until this point, uh, the CIP is a big pie that we're always trying to fit together, uh, and there's never enough pie, um, and so we, we are always, it's a, a delicate balance, and we're also this year, and I really appreciate my colleagues on the committee, uh, trying to be really intentional about making sure that we're telling the truth and having the appropriate levels of funding for things we know are going to happen like the systemic so we're going to we've been sticking to that and uh, I believe we'll, hopefully that'll continue throughout the entire CIP process. Um, grateful to our colleagues at MCPS as well for being uh, and OMB for being um, just great partners as we've requested these non-recommended cuts. We're always reminded they are non-recommended. We would all want everything to happen uh, and, but we just realized that that is not possible with the resources we have. Uh, so this is our fourth work, fourth and final work session on the CIP for MCPS. Um, we, uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, council staff to lead us through the packet. And we have several, um, you know, kind of just things that we've already decided, but just to reaffirm and, and make some final decision points. So I think we'll start with Mr. Levchenko. Yeah, I'll, I'll provide a, an overview of where things are at this point and some uh, new things and then Mr. McGuire will walk us through um, quickly some of the specifics. Uh, just as you noted, we've had several work sessions, and um, most notably last last week's work session, we talked a lot about the uh, non-recommended reductions and the two different scenarios that uh, MCPS provided to the committee. Uh, the committee expressed uh, support for scenario A as a starting point. Uh, we want to emphasize this does not mean the committee is uh, actively supporting every reduction that's in Scenario A, but they like the philosophy of Scenario A, and we will we can work from that as we work towards reconciliation. And uh, we do need a baseline to work from, and, and uh, the committee was supportive of, of that scenario as that baseline. Yeah, and Mr. Levchenko, I'm glad you said that. I'll state that in a slightly different way, that if we can get other things in, and we will, in light of that, but that's the approach we're taking. We have right. to make sure we account for those things. So I appreciate you bringing that point up. Right. And uh, most notably, as we, as we discussed, the, the Scenario A does provide additional resources. It doesn't just cut, but it also adds in the out years for a number of systemic projects, which was something that the GO Committee, as well as Council staff, had been working with OMB and MCPS on for some time. Uh, so there was, there was already a, a lot of discussion about that, and the committee was supportive of that concept as well. Uh, of course, we'll see how much of that we can accommodate in, in the reconciliation, but we like starting there, as, a, as we mentioned before, as a baseline to try to see how much of that we can, we can uh, fit in, in, as you mentioned, the truth in budgeting. So that's, what we're, that's our goal. Um, uh, for today's work session, we, we have tried to wrap everything up. Uh, there are a few new things I wanted to mention, or, or new items that are noted in the packet. Uh, some additional communications that, that um, the committee has received from fellow council members, uh, a couple are here today, uh, as well as um, from the Montgomery County Senate delegation, so we can talk about that a little bit after we get through this packet. Uh, and then also we had on March 14th the county executive's recommendations that came over on the operating budget, but also there were a number of CIP recommendations. And there were a couple of recommendations specific to the MCPS CIP, and I've noted them on page three of the packet. Uh, they, the executive updated uh, his affordability reconciliation project uh, to provide a little more uh, capacity in, with current revenue for the technology modernization project. 
Uh, so th this is more of a capacity issue about how much space there is in the CIP. The project itself will be discussed um, in the context of the MCPS operating budget uh, later in April. Uh, so the committee and then ultimately the council can decide on how much current revenue is available in the CIP and whether it should go further to this project or elsewhere. Uh, we can talk about that at a later date. We don't need to talk about it specifically today. But just to note that that did come over from the executive. Um, the other one is a placeholder project. Uh, it's called Building Towards a Structurally Balanced CIP. Uh, and it's getting at what we talked about a little bit earlier about the out years of the CIP. And we mentioned how with the systemic projects, they were light on a number of those projects. Uh, and the executive is, has noted his support for that approach, uh, which is helpful to hear, uh, and is also recommending uh, some additional macro adjustments, once again, later in the CIP uh, to support some additional funding for MCPS in those years. Once again, we can deal with that as part of the broader reconciliation. The committee doesn't have to make a decision on that today. Uh, but I just wanted to note that the executive is um, trying to work towards the same result that, that we are here. And we'll, we'll try to take that into account as we go forward. I think this executive quote cited the work of the committee, mm -hmm. I think, in that communication. So we appreciate uh, the acknowledgment of that we're trying to work together towards that goal. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. McGuire. <clears throat> Thank Ms. McGuire, if we go, is, is sure. Mr. Adams he coming? Is, he is he's not, not able to be here today. Okay. If, could you just int introduce yourself? Sure. Let's just do that real quick. I'm Adrian Karamihas. I'm the Director of Capital Planning for Montgomery County Public Schools. Got it. Is Ms. Is Ms. Lagrange? Yeah. Okay. No. I don't see. Wasn't someone? Oh, um, Ms. Lagrange is here uh, today uh, to speak. Uh, if oh, there are questions on the Damascus, uh, when, we right. get, when we get yeah, to the discussion right. around the Damascus programming. Yeah. Cut you we'll be happy to yeah, stay out of the hot seat as long as, <laughs> as, long as possible. Yeah, I, I've been looking right at you there. And then, uh, Ms. Hawa, thank you for being here as always. Yeah, from OMB. Okay, go ahead, Ms. McGuire. Thank you. The remainder of the packet really um, is our attempt to summarize all of the extensive discussion that the committee has uh, has had um, and to really uh, crystallize it into the form of the recommendations that we've heard uh, from that discussion. And this, of course, um, is, as you said, the intent for today is to review this, um, have any further discussion that's necessary on aspects of it, and then, of course, we will um, turn that around for your recommend committee's recommendation to the county council, which uh, that review is scheduled for the morning of April 2nd. Um, so I'll just uh, briefly walk through the sections of that. We have tried to capture literally everything so that hopefully it can all be found here. Um, as has discussed, uh, this does take the non-recommended scenario A as the starting point. Um, and from that baseline, again, what we've reflected here are the discussions and the um, priorities that the committee has identified through that. The primary um, philosophical purpose and approach of Scenario A is to prioritize funding for the systemic infrastructure projects. Um, include future funds in the out years of the, of the CIP that will, um, that are anticipated to be requested and needed, and to, as was said, structure a sequence and a schedule that is maintainable and uh, hopefully um, brings uh, fewer delays in future CIPs. So the first section here on page four of your packet identifies um, individual projects that are not impacted from the Board of Education's request. And so um, the I'll just list them briefly here. Burtonsville Elementary, Lellick at Broad Acres Elementary, Crown High School, Greencastle Elementary, Highland View Elementary, Page Elementary, Silver Spring International Middle, Nielsville Middle, Poolsville High School, Northwood High School, Woodward High School, and Piney Branch Elementary School Major Capital Project, which has planning funds. All of those projects uh, are recommended to move forward on the requested schedule um, by the board. I would just comment that um, most of those are currently in progress in some way, uh, if not in construction, imminently in construction, um, or again, uh, very close at hand. So uh, two, um, the Burtonsville replacement and Lellick replacement um, are early in the CIP, but again, um, were, were maintained in Scenario A and certainly were identified as a high priority by the, by the committee. The next set of projects um, are removed 
uh, they are newly requested projects. So these are three addition projects that were newly requested to be included in the CIP and their funding would be removed under this reduction scenario. That's Mill Creek Town Elementary School, Blake High School, and Paint Branch High School. The committee discussion of these projects did of course elevate that Mill Creek Town um, among those three would have, it has certainly the highest level of overutilization and again could potentially um, be uh, a, a candidate for restoration if funds are available during reconciliation. The committee also had extensive discussion regarding the elementary major school ca major capital projects, uh, Cold Spring, Damascus, Twinbrook, and Whetstone Elementary Schools. Ultimately, Scenario A does preserve the planning funds for those projects and shifts the construction funds for those projects, which are at this point placeholder fiscal capacity um, funds shifts them later into the CIP and the committee had extensive discussion around doing that planning work but coming back with um, more information in uh, the coming months around um, what a sequencing might look like, what other sustainable approaches to those projects might look like, and just different options for really addressing the infrastructure and the needs of those schools. But again, having that planning work as a way to really be able to analyze how they would ultimately sequence into the CIP. Um, coming to the high schools, um, Scenario A does assume, and the um, committee did not um, at this time recommend changes to the following three high schools in the Board of Education's um, I'm sorry, let me restate that. The following three high schools uh, are impacted by Scenario A. Damascus High School, um, the construction for Damascus High School would be shifted to FY29 with a TBD completion date. The committee, of course, had extensive discussion around Damascus High School, and I know we'll come back to some of those discussion points around the project itself, as well as the automotive programming aspect of that project. I will note that at the last meeting, the committee did request that MCPS provide um, a written formal uh, plan and response of how that programming would be expanded in the uh, up county area going forward. Magruder High School would have the funding removed and uh, again be uh, considered in future CIP cycles. For Wooten High School, MCPS uh, and under this scenario would maintain the funding in FY25 and 26 which is uh, intended to address exterior improvements and the related ADA modifications um, that are part of both the building and that exterior. MCPS did report at the last work session that that would address the bulk of the outstanding ADA access concerns and the remainder of the building renovations um, would then be shifted to a later phase uh, in, in an out year of the CIP. The committee did identify Eastern Middle School as a high priority for restoration from the, um, the non-recommended reduction uh, shift out of the, to the out years of the CIP uh, and identified that as a high priority to bring back as close to the requested schedule as possible. The committee also recommended shifting the funds for the planning of the new Bethesda Chevy Chase and Walter Johnson Cluster Elementary School to the out years of the CIP. Um, given the utilization and capacity information of the clusters at this time, it seems less pressing to do in the early years. However, the committee did acknowledge that there um, is some community engagement and planning work to do around that shift, and so we'll work with MCPS to understand how best to represent that work in the CIP. Um, and then really what we uh, come down to at this point is the very significant increase in systemic funding uh, that is facilitated by this approach and prioritized um, uh, in this approach. And the committee's support for this does add nearly $211 million to the key systemic infrastructure projects as outlined on page 5 of your packet. This includes ADA, uh, HVAC, relocatable classrooms, sustainability, improved safe access to schools, fire safety, emergency replacement of major building components, healthy schools, and building modifications and program improvements. Just to conclude briefly, um, the committee on page six of your packet uh, lists the remaining countywide and systemic infrastructure projects, which again, the committee's support uh, is for those projects to remain at the level requested by the Board of Education. Thank you, uh, Ms. McGuire, Mr. Lovchenko. That's really well stated and concise. I just want to emphasize again, I've been on this committee on my sixth year, putting $211 million towards these projects, which I hear about every time I go to a school, something on this list, 
is just a I think a really really big step for us to take and and will improve the lives of students in their schools and families for years to come and uh, and 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 just put us in a better scenario and have the really the other bonus of when you're in the CIP for a major renovation or for a new school the likelihood that it stays on track will increase uh, because we're including this um, so with that, uh, let, let's. There's several issues we need to take up. Let's start with uh, the Damascus High School. So, Mr. Grange, come on down, please. Um, and we've talked about this uh, uh, previously, but I want to. We, we're joined by colleagues, and we want to make sure we have a full full airing of this, and we have more technical staff here to talk about the programming side, uh, which we haven't had before. So that we appreciate that. Um, my understanding is that the school system and the school board voted last week to centralize it well not they've done this a while ago has centralized CTE programs uh, at Seneca in the as the up county in Thomas Edison I've, I've had the honor of being at the opening of both of those projects you know one last council or they both were last council but they're amazing buildings and if you haven't seen them and, and have a lot to offer uh, but we did also say that we want to make sure that you can completely articulate, and we've had discussions about this before, about career and technical education and work-based learning and other, other aspects, particularly around career and technical education, what the vision is. Uh, our foundation partners, I think I see some here today, have expressed concern uh, about the where we're going, right? And, and uh, we, we appreciate them being here today and their partnership uh, with industry. Um, so. I'll start with a question and then I'll turn to my colleagues on the committee and then I'll turn to, I'm assuming everyone probably wants to ask something here. Uh, so Damascus High School currently uh, offers automotive, IT, child development, and horticulture, right? Is that correct? Did I get those four? Okay. And technical, uh, career, career and tech programs. What will remain as part of this project? Can you just get that, be clear about that? Thank you. And introduce yourself, please. Oh, thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Irina Lagrange. I am the Director of College and Career Readiness and District-wide Programs for Montgomery County. Um, and with this Damascus project, uh, we are really excited at this opportunity to modernize our current CTE programs and to be innovative and reflective not just of student needs and student asks, but also 21st century demands to ensure that our students are leaving with certification that provides them with high wage, high pay, high demand positions. And so with um, Damascus High School, um, there were several asks. Uh, one ask us was for us to think about career and technical education programs, as I've mentioned, that are reflective of student needs. The other was for us to think about flexible space. So we know that there's going to be an increase in enrollment. And so we really wanted to make sure that we were using all of our instructional spaces, that they were flexible and we could use them throughout the day. And then the third ask was also for us to think about the current program. So you were absolutely correct in the four programs. They also have professional restaurant management, but at that time they don't have a teacher. So those students are not taking advantage of that program. So in looking at the demand. That would be also like nickname hospitality mm -hmm. program. Correct, right? correct. And so what we're looking, so it's also important to keep in mind that the project for Damascus would take some, quite some time in terms of us recommending programs. And so the optimal word here is recommending because the process to introduce new prog uh, programs includes student voice data, uh, parent voice data, includes teacher voice data, and of course community. So we really want to see what are the programs that could be there and what would the students get excited about. Um, so before I share some of the pro programs we're considering, um, it's important also to acknowledge that our goal as a district is to make sure that every high school has strong local programs. So right now, as you've mentioned, we have 51 CTE programs. We're really excited about that. But we cannot have 51 CTE programs at all of our 25 high schools. We just can't do that. So the question is, what do the local high schools have? What are they proud of? What are the strong programs? so that students can stay at those schools. As you've already mentioned, uh, we do have the Down County Hub for CTE for some of our CTE programs is Edison, and it's an incredible program. So if you, those of you who have not had a chance to visit recently, we invite you and we'd love to share that with you. Then during the pandemic, we opened up uh, Seneca Valley as our Up County Hub, brand new, and we still have room, of course, to build and expand, and we want to make sure that students in the upper count of, uh, part of the county have access to the programs there. 
um, because we want to make sure that they're not traveling all the way down county and all over the county because Seneca Valley was designed as the up county hub. So in terms of the programs, what programs are we looking at currently? At Damascus, we're recommending, again, so the recommended programs, of course, um, with the automotive program, uh, the recommendation is there's a flexible space, and the recommendation is to think about an innovative program that looks at 21st century emerging auto technologies, that looks at um, 21st century cars, and what would that look like, and what would our students, uh, what could our students do to prepare them for those future jobs. Again, we do have the foundations here with us today, and the automotive foundations represented and so we look forward to collaborating with them. We know we would have their support in creating those programs that would meet those future needs of the car of our car industry. So currently, so just to, just to you know, there's been some. So that collaboration is yet to happen. So we so we have our supervisor in the program um, works and meets with the PACs regularly. I work with him. So the conversation is happening um, through MCPS. It might not be happening in silos, but in terms of us having the PACs partnership where we meet regularly, our supervisor meets regularly with, uh, with the PACs. And so, of course, the conversation is happening, but the conversation needs to continue, and the conversation needs to include more stakeholders. So if I could just... So and, and sure, I, I went a little bit of a long way around, but I think it is important to point out with currently with our traditional automotive program. So we have automotive programs currently available at four high schools. We have two programs total, and both of the programs for automotive technology and collision is available at Thomas Edison High School. And Gaithersburg High School also has two programs. Now Seneca Valley and Damascus have automotive technology, so they have the same program. And so students, for example, who wanted to follow, let's just as an example, who wanted to follow that traditional pathway, they would have access to Seneca Valley High School. Um, Seneca Valley High School offers five part-time CTE programs, and there are currently students from Seneca Valley High School taking advantage of those programs. We have MCPS transportation available, and we have students traveling currently to Seneca Valley from Damascus for both AM and PM programs. So they go in the morning, MCPS buses bring them back, or they go in the afternoon. So that traditional program is there and available. Just before you move on to the next program, on that point, we've heard I've heard conflicting information about the capacity of that program. Um, is there? And I know there's a chicken and egg kind of thing. Of you have to, you mentioned the hospitality program is not because you don't have a teacher. It's not because there's not space for it, but it's because there's not a there wasn't an, a, a person, a body that could teach it. So what is the capacity? How is Seneca Valley the automotive program, you're, the traditional program you're describing, at capacity? So I'm so glad you framed that that way. So Seneca Valley, as we shared, is a new program. So currently they only have one teacher. So it is a capacity with us having one teacher in that program. So in that sense, it's a capacity. If we bring another teacher and there's plenty of room, it's a beautiful space. We have cars, we have lifts, there's enough of the instructional space that if we were to increase the number of teachers, then we would certainly have more room for that program. So that's obviously an operating budget question. Correct. Correct. Right. Or, or to move a teacher. I mean, there's plenty. Or you so could move it within the correct. current budget. Correct. So, you so, have plans to do that. So this is all possible. So again, this is all down the road. These are the conversations. This right. is all on the table. Absolutely possible. So in terms of physical space, is there space? Absolutely. There is space. Okay. There's space for that. And then I also, if I can just, I didn't answer one part of yeah, your question. Finish, yeah. In terms of the then programs that we are looking at based, um, and I think I shared this, that currently we have over 260 Damascus students whose home school is Damascus who are actually in other regional and countywide programs. And so that was another question to look at the data and to see why are so many students going to other schools and not staying at their high school. And so that was the first step as I shared, this is a long process and we have plenty of time to engage students and other stakeholders, but we looked at the hard data. So we looked at the data, what programs are students in who are leaving Damascus and not going to their home school? And so based on that data, some of the programs we're considering are, for example, there is a new program we're exploring in engineering. And that program um, includes um, AI, it includes robotics, it includes um, real world problems where students have an opportunity to collaborate and to use engineering technologies to solve those 
those problems. That's one recommendation, and we're exploring that with University of Maryland College Park. That would lead to certification and college credits. We're looking at healthcare professions. So with healthcare professions, we know that our students could get certification at the end of the program. And the wonderful thing with that is for students who are being economically responsible, and we hear this a lot from our high school students who want to work and um, at the same time get college credits because they're anxious about taking out loans. Such a, such a um, certification provides them a perfect opportunity. There's a high need in Montgomery County for healthcare professionals. They could work and go to school. We looked at Law, Justice, and Society. That's another program that's new that we're excited about. It leads into law, in, uh, law enforcement jobs. It leads into possible uh, uh, other careers within that field. Um, we also thought about would there be an opportunity, for example, to create a humanities program so that students didn't have to travel to different parts of the county. And so that's something that the curriculum team would sit down with students, with staff. We would look at what's already available that MSD has approved, and we might consider building new programs. So the bottom line is that all of this is on the table, and, and we're excited. So this, this unfortunately has turned out to be a very stressful conversation when it was really meant to be an exciting opportunity. Um, and we still believe, we're confident that we can make, ex get the community involved and get real every, hear everyone's voice because I do feel it's important that what Damascus is a large community. Um, it's a community with tremendous tradition and a sense of community, but we want to get everybody at the table and we really want to hear what are the students interested in and what can we provide for them that will allow them to remain at their school. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. So I'm going to wrap up and then turn to my colleagues on the committee and then our colleagues who have joined us. So I heard a couple things that I didn't know prior to today or I wasn't sure about. There is space at Seneca Valley. You just need to add educators. That's on the table. If you wanted to if to travel if, and you would provide that transportation, like is already happening with some students. Correct. There are 260 Damascus students that leave Damascus High School for other programs, some of which you mentioned. Um, and you did that analysis, and that's factored into your decision to look at a flexible approach in the new Damascus High School, which, as we've recommended provisionally here, would not begin construction until FY 29. Correct. Uh, okay, so which, so leaving time to figure all of this out. Assume you, you've recommitted to improved in cross-sectoral conversation with not only our foundation partners but the entire community in Damascus to trying to figure out what they want the be what they want to see. Correct. Uh, you have some ideas, but you're going you're committing to that that process. Correct. All right, and at some point, as we've requested before there's a final determination on scope and size, you'll come back to this committee uh, and to the board, obviously, with a with a more robust plan about what exactly you're going to do. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I'm going to turn to Councilmember Mink first uh, for questions. Great. Thank you. Um, appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Um, we're talking a little bit about programming. I'll just name this. Uh, obviously, we're not here to do programming, but it's very relevant to the conversation, obviously. Uh, so I appreciate that everybody's being flexible about that. Um, for background, for the millions watching at home, as Chair Jawanda likes to say, there you go. Um, MCPS has four nonprofit educational foundations, um, and uh, there's, they're each kind of divided up by industry. So we've, we're talking about automotive, we're talking about restaurant and hospitality, um, and there's also construction, and there's information technology, and then these are foundations that bring together business and industry partners um, with MCPS to provide educational opportunities to students. Um, classroom instruction, lab settings, but also authentic real world experiences and providing students for, uh, for the real world um, once, they, once they leave school. And, and to be clear, um, set up for students who may go directly into the workforce, but also set up partnering with um, uh, Montgomery College, with uh, universities at Shady Grove uh, for college track uh, experiences as well. Um, Everybody here knows that, but um, I've learned a lot <laughs> of late, and so I want to make sure that the folks who are watching have that upper, uh, background as well. Um, okay, uh, the hospitality program. So Damascus uh, is one of three has one of three professional grade kitchens. Is that right? Uh, in MCPS. Um, and uh, so the other two, with the Damascus program being shut down or on pause, 
coming back with questions about that. Um, the other two are at Edison and, and Paint Branch. So I just want to note that because geographically, right, then without Damascus, we don't have we don't have this program available up county. Um, Graduates of the program get their certification from the American Culinary Federation, which is very highly regarded. Uh, industry certification requires inspections of the facility, close examinations of the curriculum, all of those things. Um, really appreciate MCPS and our foundation partners uh, for working to make sure that we were meeting all of those requirements and were able to provide opportunities like that. Um, and uh, and I've heard that we have graduates who are frequently uh, graduates of that program who are frequently entering the workforce and making you know 70k or more shortly after graduation, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so want to certainly appreciate our foundation partners. Um, I know that uh, D David Child is here from Bethesda Marriott. Um, they've been great partners. Uh, and thank you to MCPS also uh, for the collaboration. Um, wanted to clarify what's happening with the hospitality program at Damascus. So it, was it not running this year because of the lack of a, of a teacher? And we're hopefully going to be starting that back up in the future, or what's going on with that? Thank you so much for bringing that, and I'm so glad that you did um, acknowledge the foundations. Um, I think it's critical, the partnership that we do have with them. And if I can just backtrack a little bit, um, for example, our automotive foundations, they have had a history of 40-year long history in Damascus uh, yeah. area. Um, they hold our annual used car dealership sale, which is a huge part of the community. Um, and also with our uh, Marriott partnership, of course, continued work with current students, our graduates. I think it's also important to acknowledge that um, there's a brand new um, state-of-the-art um, kitchen that's been put into Montgomery College. So now we're exploring with dual enrollment where students have access to college classes at no cost to families, how we could also use that state-of-the-art space. Um, it's on the Rockwell campus. So our students would have access to public transportation and to um, other ways of, of getting there to that site. So I really appreciate you say, uh, sharing that. I think it's also important to think about when we think about our foundations the very close partnership that we have in also using our um, Perkins uh, funds to support teachers, um, to pay for materials for our students. So the, the partnership, the current partnerships um, between the foundations and MCPS is deep and it has a long history. So again, with um, working together to make sure, and we've had that opportunity as MCPS to provide all the instructional materials for our students and to make sure that our students have access to not just certification, but all the materials that they need to be successful. Um, so that's really important to acknowledge as well. In terms of the program at the school, um, the teacher, the principal made a decision not to offer the program this year because he was not able to find a teacher. Uh, we have a couple of students who are going uh, who are going to the program at Seneca Valley. So Seneca Valley um, has, again, multiple part-time programs. Um, that is uh, the tourism management is one of them. So students are going there. And the idea, my understanding with the new uh, renovation that there will be a space for that program. And of course, the idea that's never been discussed for that program to be taken off the table. We just have to make sure that there's student interest and that we have the staffing to provide it. Okay, well, that's good to hear. When you say that it will be in the new building, do you mean Work, the same quality, the, the kitchen, the whole the whole setup there? So again, we are, um, it's down the road, um, so I know that there we've had a conversation uh, with our team to talk about creating flexible spacing and again thinking about not just having a couple of hundred, almost 300 students come back to their home school and have that as an option. And I say that again for Damascus because there is, that's a community where the, where the pride and the sense of, 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 of being a Damascus resident runs deep. So again, having students come back and have the opportunity to go to their home school because they're excited about the programs, but then also adding 600, possibly adding hundreds of additional seats. And with that ask, we have to be cognizant and intentional in creating instructional spaces that can be used uh, multiple times during the day. So not just during the time when that one teacher is teaching, but can we have access to those spaces for seven periods during the day? Because what we don't want to do is build a new school and then have to have portables within a year because the students don't fit. So again, the idea that we're looking at right now in, in thinking about design is the, and I'm going to let you speak to that a little bit more, but thinking about the flexibility of the space. So I can't right now answer and say the size of that space and what it would look like, but of course our commitment to the program and having it be driven by students and interest is there. And, and again, exploring our other spaces, state-of-the-art, brand new spaces that are available to us through Montgomery College. 
I hear you on that, and, and I think intentional is the right word, and I, and I think it's important that we also uh, read that to mean intentional about making sure that we are staying true to what the state of Maryland and what the blueprint and what the community has asked of us, which is that these programs are preparing students for the real world. So if we go too far to making, making these spaces be able to accommodate a bunch of different things, um, and, and we lose the ability to ensure that we are preparing these students for the real world and to, you know, industry, national industry standards, all of those things, um, then we've watered them down to where it really wasn't worth making, you know, the part way investment in the first place. So um, I think it's going to be crucial to, as you have noted, uh, to work directly with those industry partners. I um, appreciate you referencing a, an MCPS um, liaison, but I think it's really important as you're making these decisions. I would think it would be of, of great value for you to have those industry partners in the room to have a, a dialogue back and forth about some of these specifications and and um, what pieces are actually needed for each of these programs to be in the building to make sure that we're meeting those standards. What is it possible to take out um, and what needs to be left in? Um, and I think we're going to pause because I think Councilmember Lutke has to so we'll come back. Can I just, I'll come, can I just also answer just that question too that um, with the blueprint, we um, also another emphasis is on work-based learning opportunities and so we are excited with the foundations. We know the Automotive Foundation, the endless partnerships that they have with different dealerships in Montgomery County, again, creating internship opportunities for our students and even apprenticeships with the Marriott industry and the different restaurants. I mean, they have, uh, the, uh, the team has hosted so many different successful events. So again, uh, we talked about Summer Rise before. So really thinking about work-based learning opportunities and that real world experience that you were sharing about because a classroom is one thing, but being in a beautiful, brand new, multi-million dollar restaurant in a hotel is a completely different experience. So again, and thinking about um, where those summer rise opportunities, where the internship opportunities, the apprenticeship opportunities, and that's where the beauty of our partnership and our, our collaborations with the foundations is so critical because they do have the resources and they have been most supportive and we look forward to continuing that and building upon that. Thank you. So we'll pause. I know Councilmember Lukey has to leave soon, so we're going to turn to turn to her. Thank you. And um, I, first, I just want to thank the committee for your very, very thoughtful work on this and, and methodically moving through things. And I fully support um, the committee's approach to getting, you know, more realistic capital improvement budgeting moving forward from MCPS, where things are not front loaded, but they are done in a, a more sy systematic method that's that's more accurate for the community and for us in, in doing the work that we need to do in order to make sure there's capacity. Um, and the the goal of avoiding repeated delays and deferrals. Um, and I and I appreciate that neither of the non-recommended scenarios needs to be adopted in its entirety and that's why we're here that's why i think council member balcom is here we're in a unique situation where there's a, a project the damascus project and and i was curious that you said the the down the road because actually there was five million in the fy 25 budget for this project and the planning and design stuff had been happening in those community conversations before i even got on the council so it doesn't really feel down the road, right? Especially not to that community. That's a concern. And um, back when I first started and we went to a PTA meeting and Seth Adams was there with us, the big concern that the community had, as you noted, they have a lot of pride in the school. Um, and since it was built in 1950 and hasn't had a renovation since before most of us sitting up here were born, um, Folks have had their grandparents and their parents all graduate on that same football field. And the big issue was, will we be able to have graduation on the football field while the renovations are happening, right? So it's not that issues don't come up. The automotive program issue just came up in December. And the community was caught off guard about that. And I certainly appreciate the forward thinking about how we may be doing this as we move into new technologies and newer ways of doing things. Um, but right now we've got capacity issues at both Damascus and Clarksburg high schools. And with respect to the program at Seneca, which you mentioned, there's one teacher and that's at capacity because there's one teacher, but the Damascus program has about 80 kids in it enrolled for the next school year, um, according to the school. Um, so I'm just going to leave that there, but that's a lot of 
students to be uprooting and saying you may not be able to do your thing next year. Um, I'm glad to hear that there's transportation that can be provided because that's not always the case. We have a lot of programs including the aerospace program at Magruder where kids apply and they're all excited because this is a great offering and then they find out oh wait there's no transportation for me to get there and unless you have a parent who can take you sometimes a 45 minute drive you're not going to be able to get there. Um, so those are really important things as we think about how to, you're right, we can't have every program at every school, but how can we be more methodical about that? And and I do appreciate that you referenced the, the dual enrollment issue and, and the po increasing popularity of that, right? That is important so that students who can maximize obtaining college credits while they're in high school won't have as many loans or won't have as many financial obligations later. But I note that we are second to last in the state of Maryland in our dual enrollment rates. Second to last. The only school system with lower dual enrollment than us is Baltimore City. Our neighboring counties, Frederick County and Howard County, Frederick County's rate is approaching 20% um, and Howard County's is approaching 15%. And so I, I, I applaud the aspirational goal, but we're kind of way behind on that trend um, and we need to do better. Um, and so my big concern is that this has been promised to this community for a very long time and it's not a situation where we're talking about getting started with the planning. Plans have already been provided to the community. Um, and construction was set to begin in the fiscal year beginning on July 1st. So, so I would love to hear why you're taking the position you are. So I'm going to thank you. I wrote down three three questions that I'm going to answer. And so I think what's also important that there are my colleagues here. Mm -hmm. And so the work, the way it happens, it happens in phases. And so the programs that I was speaking to, that comes later. Mm -hmm. Because once we have the flexible spacing, then we have time to build a program. So we're not, the, what they're doing right. takes much longer. It's a much bigger lift. The building programs is the exciting part. And so we sure. do have time for that. And it's not as urgent. Um, what I also wanted to share, I think it's really important when you mentioned the aviation program. So mm -hmm. I think one thing, the conversation that we've been having as a district is thinking about the programs that we've had. So some of our career and technical education programs have been around for a long time mm -hmm. and others such as that one are pretty new. So I think one thing that we're going to have to do and it's going to be a difficult conversation is to think about what 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 does the data within our programs say about student interest and is it of time to, to continue some programs and multiply them at other schools so that transportation is not an issue mm -hmm. and so that more children have access to them. The programs that have waiting lists, should we be creating, uh, allowing those programs or, or engaging students at other schools to have access to them? And then if there are some programs maybe where there isn't an interest anymore, is it time to sunset those programs? And those are difficult conversation because sure. tradition comes in, we, we've had those programs for a long time, but I do think it's time that we have those difficult conversations to think about what are children saying, what are they interested in, and how can we make it happen. And then the last thing that I did want to just share, um, so with our dual enrollment, um, you are correct in saying that, for example, Frederick County, their enrollment is much higher. Frederick County is able to use their own local high school teachers to teach college mm -hmm. level courses. Mm -hmm. And so that's one thing that we have not been able to do. So our students, and we've had a great partnership with Montgomery College, our students either travel to Montgomery College to take classes, or they now do them online and so again we are looking always looking at exploring um, different options and increasing the capacity because one thing that we are finding is that and I've shared this with you before is that the transportation is difficult in right. this district we're a really large district and so we have created a, as part of the blueprint central stops which allow our students to travel to Montgomery College with tra uh, central MCPS transportation Montgomery College has created multiple classes online so our students can access them from school or from home and we appreciate that and we do look forward to increasing the number of courses our students can take because the feedback has been incredibly mm -hmm. positive and we want to make sure that more of our students can not just leave with more credits but maybe even with associates degrees mm -hmm. uh, because that will tremendously impact their pathway and their opportunity then to transition to other institutions within the district and then I wanted you to also have a chance I'll 
So I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. So we are, you are correct, in the midst of design. Could and what we do is, um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, even, um, w especially with a high school where there are very large spaces, what we do is when we start that design process is that we build big boxes. We show big boxes. So um, we can fit multiple different kinds of programs in those spaces. We just have, we designate the space and once we collaborate and work and decisions are made, then we go back into those spaces and say, okay, this is the requirements within those spaces. So we can, we can start and continue our design process where no final decisions have been made on for the majority of those CTE or specialty spaces. The other thing I also just wanted to clarify, we are in the midst of design. We have been designing. Right. We've been out to the community. I've been out to the community right. numerous times. Um, for next year, those students that are in the program will be at that program. We right. are not starting construction next year. So there is still ample time to you know, let these students know that there may be a transition if they want to continue the program and go to Seneca Valley, but that will not happen next year. They will be where they are for next year. There is no construction starting come this summer. Well, um, two points, and thank you for raising the, the issue about not having the teachers in the schools who are able to teach the college certified classes, right? Um, again, we're the only school system in the state that has zero of those, zero. I'm looking at the state's 2022 annual dual enrollment report, and that's based on MCPS's data. The data that gets into that report comes from each individual school system. And I'm looking at the chart, and there's big zero for Montgomery County. Is it a zero for number of teachers? No, it's a zero for courses with the dual enrollment flag being taught by the school system. And there are over 10,000 courses offered statewide that do have that. Right, so we have zero. Um, I think the next lowest number if district was Kent County, which only has one high school and they have 44 classes that are fit that flag. Um, so my concern, again, is that we not delay the construction because every time we delay, we're compounding problems for two different school clusters in two different regions and it's not like again you're talking about the very northern end of the county where there's nowhere else to go that's nearby for Clarksburg and for Damascus and I think it was incredibly telling that we had so many people from Clarksburg High School come to support Damascus in the public hearings on the CIP because of the issue and because of the the double impacted effect on those two communities so i appreciate the 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 ongoing conversation and creativity that we can apply for the automotive tech program and other programs and ways that we can be more flexible moving forward in meeting those needs and and finding ways to improve upon things we already have um, but I don't want the operational logistical issues to get in the way or cloud the discussion on the construction and renovation issue. Um, again, as I said, this building's approaching its 75th birthday. So um, with that, I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lukey. Uh, I'm going to yield to Councilmember Balcom, and then we'll come back to the committee uh, after that. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for being here. And um, thanks to Councilmember Lutke, uh, we share a boundary and very often uh, one bleeds right into the other and this is one of those situations. Uh, um, some of my constituents attend um, Damascus and I, the expectation is that with, with an expanded uh, school, more will. So, um, so that's why I'm here. Um, aside from supporting my my neighbor. Um, so I'm getting mixed signals in terms of, in one sense, uh, the de decisions don't meet, need to be made now, and there is an ongoing discussion about what's going to happen in the schools, but then also the decision is going to be made now as to whether the automotive program goes into that school. So there's a mixed, um, a mixed message. So just to clarify, your, the MCPS is proposing to not go forward with the automotive program, the traditional automotive program right now. 
our recommendation at this time um, is to be innovative and to think about a program that we could um, use that would be reflective of 21st century needs. Um, the discussion we're having... So the, just to clarify, so you're saying that the traditional automotive program that's currently at Damascus will not be there? So it's a discussion because the current program, um, the current traditional program, has a very large footprint. And so I think the decision has to be made. Um, if we are to go with a traditional program, um, it's going to take up space from other instructional spaces. It will impact the side road. It will have tremendous impact. I so if the decision's made, to go with a traditional program that can be done, we just all have to be cognizant and aware of how that's going to impact the rest of the building. And we also just have to be mindful, my understanding, and I can defer to my colleague, that that instructional space would cost $12 million. And so the question is, are we, is, is as a district, are we going to invest $12 million into a traditional space that currently serves 57 students? And if the decision is that um, that is what we're willing to do, then that is something that we can build. And then the other the decision is to create a large flexible space that we're together with our foundations partners and the automotive industry we can build something um, that's exciting that's forward-thinking that will still give our students access to certification and um, that will lead to those high-paying jobs because we know with electric cars there's a tremendous need okay. and then students who want to do the traditional program have access to it eight miles away and the program okay. is yeah. beautiful and, and, and councilman back just to add just so you to your point the Board of Education voted last week to to do what you just said, to not have the traditional automotive okay. program. Now, they could change their mind. It's obviously sure. in their purview to decide the programming. Uh, we approved the CIP. I just wanted to make it be clear that that was the Board's decision. So to, to the extent that MCPS staff is operating, they're operating based on the Board's decision, which could, which could be revisited, of okay. course. Okay, thank you. Um, so, so thank you. I just uh, was getting mixed signals about um, the the decision. Um, so I, I am here to support uh, having the traditional program. Uh, the program is very important to the school. There's a difference between the numbers of students, whether it's 80 or 57 students. The, the the assumption is there will be more students at Damascus, so that program might increase. Neither here nor there. Um, but once the decision's made, um, you know, it, there's, it would be very costly to go back and change that decision once the building is built. Um, and I, I understand that we can't have all 51 CTE programs in every high school, but we have this program in this high school right now. And uh, I just think that it's um, not... Um, not prudent and not forward thinking to reduce a successful program. From the workforce development perspective, we should be adding more CTE programs to more high schools, not taking them away. I feel strongly about that. Uh, we have a successful program with a long legacy. You mentioned 40 year legacy in this community, uh, and that just doesn't make sense. Um, in terms of Seneca Valley, um, it's interesting, there's no guarantee that an, an additional teacher will come, given the fact that we have a hospitality program that we can't, uh, that we can't fill because we don't have a teacher. So saying that the students can move to Seneca Valley and that a teacher will appear, we know that there's no guarantee of that. So I just think that, that we need to talk about that. Um, I do have a question, and not just rambling. <laughs> um, uh, so the other, I, I want to stick to workforce development for one more second. Um, in developing a meaningful curriculum, we desperately need employers to share their very specific needs with us in order to make a curriculum to educate and train the workforce of tomorrow. Um, and one of the biggest obstacles with that is connecting industry with our educational institutions. And in this case, we have industry at the table, and they are saying that they want and need the traditional program. I've had those conversations with them. And while you're saying that you want to be innovative and create innovative programs for tomorrow, our 
current employers, the people who are employing the students, are saying that the traditional program is a better program. So I, I think that we, we ask our employers to come and, and tell us what they want. They're telling us what they want, and we need to listen. Um, so I think that's important. The, I was intrigued by you saying how many students leave Damascus. So on average, how many students at other high schools leave their high school to go to other programs? I would have to get back to you with that specific data. We have 25 high schools, so I can't speak to it off, um, off, off the top of my head right now. But that's something we can certainly share because when we I, come well, back. But I, if I, I think that's an important point. So if you're using that data point, if you're using the data to make a point, I think we need to know how that fits with other schools. So for instance, if an average of 250 school students leave their school every day to go to another program, then Damascus is on par with that. If, however, um, Damascus has an inordinate number of people leaving, that is a much bigger issue. That's a much bigger problem um, that, that uh, we need to look at. Um, and Geography matters. I, I know that's not a surprise to my colleagues when I say that. Um, so it's 9.5 miles. I know it's a, a mile and a half difference between you know um, our our view on that, but it is 9.5 9 miles from Damascus to Damascus High School to Seneca Valley High School. But it's 9.5 miles with one feasible road. Um, that is very often bumper to bumper traffic. And so I feel like it's cavalier to say this other school is eight miles down the road when it could be, I just, I just Googled it before I came here and in the middle of the day, it's 20 minutes. At the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, it's much longer than that. So um, I, I think it's important to, to accept that if, if the students don't have access, then it's an additional burden for uh, students who have been doing this program for 40 years. So that, those are my points. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate um, all of your feedback. Um, just to make three um, quick points. So if you could do so con concisely, please. Yeah. So um, we do, as I want to just reiterate, we do have students who are currently from Damascus going to Seneca Valley every day, every morning, and every afternoon, and we were not made aware of any issues so far with transportation, but I do appreciate you sharing um, about the traffic. Um, you are more familiar with the area, so thank you for that feedback. In terms of um, the number of students leaving, when we looked at the data, and again, I cannot speak to it from memory, when we looked at the, uh, all 25 high schools and the number of students leaving to go to other programs, uh, the Damascus was the significant outlier. And again, this is the reason that we think it's exciting to have an opportunity to modernize some of their programs. And then the last thing in terms of the current program at Damascus High School, in their level one class, they have 34 students. And then level two is at 17. And level three is at six students. So that means that next year, um, the hopefully all 34 students would from level one would create to level two. And then again, the program would continue. But as my colleague shared, it would not be impacted because the construction does not begin next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate, as I always do, Councilmember Balcom's ag advocacy and question. Uh, there's a core issue here, and I'm going to turn back to Councilmember Mink. Uh, I said this at the beginning, and I want you to answer it, and then, I, and then I'll turn it to Councilmember Mink. If industry is saying this is what leads to jobs, and you're saying we want to be innovative and this leads to jobs, there's th that th those things can't coexist. It's right, so because you're not industry, correct. So, unless you're saying they're like you know now I unless you're saying they're old gas industry yeah. like you know I don't think you're making that claim because I know some of them I know where they work I know where the, the, yeah. they play students they're not you know so could you just square absolutely. that round peg yeah, for me absolutely so by no means would I pretend to be an expert in our automotive industries uh, what we were sharing is a district though we have to make some difficult decisions in terms of, um, of being fiscally responsible so the question again is a district we have the traditional program available at Thomas Edison um, it's available in, for the down county students we have the traditional programs available at Gaithersburg High School and we have the traditional program available in a brand new beautiful Seneca Valley High School 
high okay. school. So the question is, it's not a matter of um, do we know better, but the question is, are we then going to build a fourth traditional site? Um, and, and that, so that's Perfect. the question. Well, I just think you should have answered it that way from the beginning, because it, you didn't. And that's a valid view. Like if you're saying, hey, there's 57, you kind of danced around it. There's 57 students or 80, whatever it is. It's not worth the money in our view based on we have all these students going other places for other programs. So we want to have it be more flexible. They can go to Seneca. Like if that's your view, fine. But I just I just felt like we we didn't get that as an answer, you know. Um, and you, and so, so you're saying, yes, there's jobs in the industry in the current program, but you're saying those can be met by sending students to other places if they want to do that. That's, is that a fair characterization? Okay. Um, Council Member Meg. Thanks, I appreciate that. Um, and, uh, and, and to the point about why we're continuing to have this conversation, um, aware of the board having weighed in on some of this as well, certainly, and, and you know, respect their opinions uh, and, and their roles, of course. Um, they're also responsive to the information and the requests that MCPS brings to them. And so as, you know, with MCPS before us, I think as part of our due diligence, continuing to dig into that information uh, is, is an important part of the process. So I appreciate the indulgence there. Um, so to the point that uh, students at Damascus could go to Seneca Valley, um, uh, how many how many Carliffs are there at Seneca Valley? I'll have to double check. I was there just yesterday. Um, multiple Carliffs. I want to say six, but um, I'll have to double check. Okay. I was there just yesterday. Okay, great. Um, let's say six. I, I think six is accurate. And uh, and how many are there at Damascus? I can't speak to that off the top of my head. Okay. Um, I, I believe it's seven. Um, so let's say six and seven. So Damascus has more Carlos than Carlos than Seneca Valley. Um, Damascus has 64 students enrolled this year, uh, with a wait list. I think that we've the the numbers flux a little bit through the year. So what number do we want to use? So currently we have, according to our database, we have 57 students. Okay, let's say 57. So 57 students enrolled currently. Um, and they had a wait list also at the start of the year, and that's across three double period classes. Um, so six traditional single class periods for math purposes. Um, Seneca Valley, I believe, has uh, 51 students. Does that sound right? Yeah. What are we at now? 44. 44, okay. And what do we say for Damascus is 57? Okay. Um, across their across their three double period classes or six single class periods, so that's not a hundred and one. Did I do that right? A hundred and one students then, uh, with the two schools who have elected to be in these programs, um, not including the waitlisted students for Damascus, uh, using cumulatively uh, thirteen uh, thirteen car lifts. So if all of those students were to be accommodated with Seneca Valley's facilities, we would need about 12 class periods, which now, can you explain how this would work that we would accommodate that number? So there is, with, with scheduling, with master scheduling, there's an opportunity. Again, the students um, have instructional classroom time, and they have time when they're working in the shop. For example, yesterday when we did the visit, the students were in the classroom. No one was using the part of the shop. And so there would be an opportunity for teachers to be innovative, as many of our teachers in other subjects share um, the instructional space, and they share the labs. And so with, with two teachers, they would be able to design a program that allows for students to work on cars and to use that instructional space um, because the students um, are they wouldn't be spread out necessarily throughout the whole space but there is an opportunity uh, for them to collaborate and to have some students in the instructional space while others are in the lab and the lab I believe is large enough to accommodate a significant number of students so the premise is that the program although it would not all of the current facilities at Seneca Valley would not um, accommodate the current program as it is uh, with all the, with the number of students. And I believe there's now more than 80 students who have signed up hoping to take uh, the, to, to, for the automotive program at Damascus for the coming school year, which I think also says something, um, that we could design a program that would be, that would use less student time at those 
base, essentially. Is that right? It would be that they would have access to the same program at Seneca Valley, and the teachers would collaborate mm -hmm. to make sure that students have the adequate amount of time, both hands-on learning and then learning the theory. Okay. So if we have, uh, if we modify the curriculum at Damascus, right, in order to, right, you're talking about doing something innovative, updating the curriculum, um, and having their, then having their kids do their hands-on work using the Karloffs at Seneca Valley, right, I'm putting these, am I putting these pieces together, right? Okay, so I want to make sure that the program, whatever the, the program is, is there, that is going to be up to industry standards from day one. Right? So MSDE has approved certain automotive programs of study that are in alignment with national industry standards that are extremely specific, like down to what specific tools are being used. So very, very specific about what this curriculum should look like and what should be included um, and what facilities need to be available to the students. And so that is what is a big part of what concerns me about this discussion that like we're just going to come up with another program because the programs exist there are certain programs that are again approved by MSDE this is one of them we have it already set up and we have all of the tools for it and the facilities for it at Damascus and I think it's a little nerve-wracking to think about eliminating the possibility for continuing that program which has been so successful and which is in alignment um, without having a, a plan, a curriculum, a program that uh, already in place that we know is going to meet those same standards. Thank you. So just to clarify, the program and the curriculum would not change. It would be the same program, same curriculum. Uh, we would not be changing that. Um, we would just co-locate the two schools. So as an example, right now at Gaithersburg High School, we have uh, two programs running at the same time with 111 students. So the school has been able to make it work. Same standard, same curr curriculum, same certification. At Thomas Edison, we have 190 students taking part of those two programs. Again, same high standard industry record recognized credentials and so we have already two schools that are um, serving larger uh, larger groups of students and are offering both programs where Seneca Valley would only be offering one of the programs so we do believe that we can be able to maintain the quality and the curriculum and the high standards at that one site okay um, two quick things Second to last thing is that I think that before we move forward with approving um, plans for a facility that is going to eliminate the possibility for um, you know things like the car lifts which are being used as part of this curriculum right now, I think it's important that we get confirmation from industry that it is possible to put together a program which meets these same standards without those those facilities there and without uh, you know and I know that there's some of those facilities at Seneca Valley I hear you but in terms of the number of students that can be accommodated while still reaching those levels so it would be great if um, you know we could hear about some of your conversations directly with industry and just uh, get some reassurance that we're going to be able to continue providing this level of programming uh, in the facility that is that is being proposed and I'll note also um, that there is a property for sale basically across the street from Damascus High School called Damascus Motors um, it is for sale for 4.3 million dollars so a far cry from 12 million dollars and there are industry partners right here who um, have said that they would be interested if MCPS was to purchase that property in discussion the possibility of a public-private partnership which would have them you know updating and maintaining that facility uh, and then uh, MCPAS being able to use it for their programming so that provides uh, a very uh, unique and tidy solution obviously lots of due diligence would would need to be done but if your conversations with industry come back with that you need space like that then this looks like potentially a much more affordable option and obviously industry would have their own natural incentive to ensure that every single year those facilities and the tools and just like with the curriculum are up to date to meet those national certification standards. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, turn to Councilmember Albernas. Thank you. Lots been said. Hello, Ms. LaGrange. It's great seeing you again. Um, and I still am so impressed and appreciative of the role that you and your team play uh, in helping to connect our students with real life and meaningful and gainful employment opportunities. Um, this is, I think, one of the 
great things I love about this job is you learn so much new every day uh, about different programs and initiatives. I was generally familiar with the automotive program, but have become much more familiar with it after this. I had my, sar my car service last week, and I will never take that for granted again, uh, I assure you. Um, but I don't have very much to add. Um, I appreciate and respect the passion from which my colleagues are coming from, which is really voicing the community's voices that we heard both through the um, public testimony process and in lots of individual conversations, both with constituents who have benefited from this program and are now gainfully employed as a result of it. Uh, we've also heard from current and former instructors. Uh, and, and, and as you've heard, industry here has been such a wonderful partner. And this represents such a unique opportunity for us to think even more outside the box than we have been. Uh, and I would say we have been innovative. Um, but I would just stress what Councilmember Mink just said, which is that you know, we shouldn't be limited to you know, what's immediately in front of us. Um, and if there are opportunities with industry this willing to come to the table, let's leverage that, take advantage of it, meet part of the way. Uh, and that goes beyond just the board or, or yours, your ability. You've got a partner here on the council, uh, as you've heard, who's very interested in working collaboratively to see what's possible here. Um, because I do think we can grow this in a way that's responsible, um, and that can be truly a model, um, not just for the state, but you know, for, for our entire area. So I look forward to the ongoing conversations. Um, we will work with you um, and see what we can do uh, to, to get you support that you need from, from this body. Thank you. Appreciate both of those points and all the conversation. We also have a partner in the state, right? You know, we mentioned there's senators that wrote in about this. They, I know there's, they're active and want to make sure that something can be resolved here. Obviously, it's the board and MCPS's job to determine the programming. We don't do that, but we do have an interest in, obviously, the overall budget and the CIP and what's built to support the programming. So there's a nexus, of course. And uh, so I think what you're hearing is, and, and I, I have heard from you today, a commitment to kind of doubling down on this engagement with industry and the community to explore um, what might be possible to maintain a program that, again, has people on the wait list for next year where kids are, are using it, uh, and address the multiple issues that we have to do, like these students that are going to other schools and the other programs and all the things that you're trying to manage. So, uh, you know, we'll come back to this uh, in the a little, you know, probably in a cursory way in the operating budget, but also uh, after the budget, the the proposal that is before us today would, you know, where you had planning dollars, there would be s small planning dollars. I think three million or so in each, twenty five and twenty six uh, is, is three million plus, but this would move the construction dollars until twenty nine. Um, is 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 the current proposal as part of the non-recommended reduction yes yeah, part of, yeah i know you don't want that but that's what we're uh, operating under right now so it good good news bad news is that you do have time to but use those planning dollars use that time to and if we have to modify the cip next year in the off year because you've come to some great agreement which i would love to have, have happen uh with industry and you say we're going to buy that property we're going to do this or here's what we're going to do and the board says, you know, comes to agreement about what they want to do and wants to come back to us and make another request, we would consider that. I think you're hearing that from, you know, one, two, three, four, five members of the council today. Um, and so uh, that's what I would ask that you all work to do over the over this next uh, year. Um, so anything else on this point? Are we going to come back? And Say it again. Are we going to come back and have this conversation again? I, a quick about the well, we if let me ask you this: Is it how much time would you need to come back? Could you come have initial conversations with industry between now and the passing of the budget in May? Okay. So what I would ask you to, to do uh, is to you can do it in writing. Uh, you can come back, or we can tack it on to another committee. Do it. Let's do it in writing. That's what staff would prefer. So let's do it in writing to the committee and to the council about uh, a little more in depth after you've gone back and talked about hearing what you've heard today and over the last several months about some potential plans and direction, uh, and so that we can have that the council can have that into consideration leading into the final passage of the budget. 
Yes, Ms. McGuire. I did just want to confirm, um, as you said, Mr. Jawando, the Damascus High School planning has um, about about three and a half million dollars in each of FY 25 and 26. And as you said, that um, does provide some additional planning time to look at some of these specific facility options if necessary. Great. Councilor Make, you have a quick final point? Sure. sure. <laughs> Um, I wanted to make a request. I think that it will go a long way with the community. Obviously, you're, we're not going to have you're not going to have any kind of deal set or long term plan. This is going to be a, you know a, a, an ongoing process, and I appreciate that, um, uh, not just through budget, but through the next year and so on. Um, but I do think that it would go a very long way with the community to be able to have a conversation. Um, Apologies to council staff, but be able to have even a quick conversation um, with industry at the table to just say, kind of, here's the start of our the beginnings of our conversations. Um, maybe there's not a lot settled there, but to to show the public and to show the community that we're in a good place and and we feel good about the direction this would go. This would go, um, and uh, I just think that that might be important at this well, point. Well, I appreciate that. I, I just I think I don't I wouldn't. I don't think it'd be appropriate to do that before the board did it. Um, and so if the board ha is going to I see we have a board member here, see, I would not presume that board member uh, Harris would speak for the entire board, but if if they were to have that conversation prior to budget, and I, I'm certainly willing to entertain as part of the operating budget discussion, tacking on, a, you know, when we get to CTE, for example, tacking on a, a quick conversation to update on what you all have discussed but I think it would be more appropriate for that to go there first just by our roles um, but I still would love for you to submit in writing at a minimum to us so I know that's not exactly what you asked for council member make but hopefully it's halfway there would it be possible to just we have a couple of our foundation um, representatives in the audience I know that we're limited on time but would it be okay for us to just get a quick verbal from them that they would that they are ready and prepared to come to the table and sit down with MCPS to have some of those conversations can we give them a quick 30 seconds sure that would be great um, David you want to come David child and Harold Redden hey it's 30 seconds David so <laughs> 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. That's what I was worried about. Yes. The, the button to the far right. There you go. Well, thank you. Yes, my name is David Child. I chair the uh, Foundation of Hospitality and Restaurant Management and have done so for uh, approximately four years now. And quite honestly, uh, for four years we've been asking for various items to be included in the budget and have had various, um, you know, stating that they will do so and you know uh, it, around the table meetings where they've said yes we're going to make it happen yes we're going to have these things in the budget and then we come to find out they're not um, we have two situations right now one is Damascus and the other one quite frankly happened in uh, Watkins Mill where we suddenly found out at the last minute that they were changing directions for a hospitality classroom there and not including any uh, equipment that you would be required for a cooking class, if you will. And fortunately, we were able to jump in at the last moment, turn that direction around and turn it into a dual classroom slash um, cooking facility, if you will. Um, and so, you know, I've heard about, I've heard the word partnership many, many times. And I'm concerned um, that Montgomery County Public School does not really consider our partnership um, a they, they think it's strong, but I'm concerned of their support is weakening the partnerships with the foundations. Um, we have an instructional specialist for the Hospitality Foundation that has never been filled, and that now relies on all of the industry professionals to spend considerable amounts of their time doing the duties of that position. And the IT Foundation instructional specialist was cut from the budget, uh, and quote, because the person that was in the position that retired and so it was easy to be able to cut that without having to make a difficult cut elsewhere. Okay. So well, I, I appreciate we appreciate your concerns. Hopefully you've heard this you've heard I know you've heard this conversation because you've been sitting right there. MCPS has said that we're gonna get back to the table here, restart partnership negotiations. But certainly I know you you'll communicate with us directly about how that's going. So perhaps, perhaps a, a letter, a, a letter that came from both the foundations and C MCPS, signed by all of us, would show full agreement. Would love to see that. As opposed to one coming from MCPS that we've never seen, 
which sounds like that's what happens in the I, past. I, I think I think that's a fair suggestion. So, would MCPS be willing? It, it sounds. I saw. It, 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 I saw a nod. So I cannot speak to MCPS, but I am certain that we will be able to provide you with an answer. Okay. Thank you. You gave you overtime, and it's in see Thank it's you. March Madness. I gave you overtime. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Hi, Will. I'm the and, and folks. I'm Harold Redden. I'm the president of the Automotive Trades Foundation. I've been serving that foundation since the mid 1990s. So I've been around a little bit, and this is very important education. It's not obsolete. Uh, we have built into the way that we um, uh, get industry certifications, which require correct curriculum to the state of the industry. Uh, and uh, we have an ecosystem that's built around our graduates having a pathway to a living wage auto technician job in the Montgomery County. Um, we've, we partner with the college. Uh, we have articulation with Montgomery College. Uh, we have a private program that's um, headed up by our trade association that allows the students that may not have the ability to just stop for two years and take a, a trade approach to it to work and receive income at a dealership while they're learning at Montgomery College to get their industry certification. So this ecosystem is, is, is built around these four programs in the county. Um, you know, the, our, our enrollment is increasing, I believe, at every school. And um, the other thing that wasn't really discussed too much uh, is there are some boundary changes that are uh, anticipated for these schools which will juggle around the enrollments a little bit uh, and, and probably the demand. But the other thing that happens, and I hear from students from time to time, is they just don't have enough space in their schedule to sacrifice a period to go to another school. Because it takes about a period of travel time, you know, which means they may not be able to be on track for graduation. So that's, that's, good that's a real important thing that we talk to our students about. Um, so anyway, I support everything that David has said. The foundation presidents, and we have four of them, as, uh, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, we work together and we work with the, um, you know, at the superintendent level and, and the people that the superintendent uh, assigns for us to work with. And I honestly have to tell you that with these quarterly meetings that we have, my first knowledge of the Damascus um, changes occurred in December, but it was not communicated through the people that we work with at, at MCPS. So I was just as surprised, and I found out from one of our service managers, who was a graduate of the Damascus program, uh, who was just devastated that this program was going away. And my first contact was in a community meeting that might have been even uh, attended by some council members uh, back in January. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, I so, think we've acknowledged the need for better and more communication. Right. I think so, you've heard that commitment. Go ahead. So we are ready, willing, able, and, and want to work with MCPS. We've, uh, in addition to the things that David has said, uh, we also question why we are not um, assisted to be put into alignment to, to qualify for the blueprint funding. And we really feel that, that um, our blueprint, um, uh, you know, the blueprint is probably designed for our kinds of programs. And, and we're just totally, um, excluded from it so we we want that conversation on the on the table as well because that's for the good of the students understood we always like multiple funding streams yeah. okay thank you very much i think we've had a fulsome discussion here we're going to move we have two other items and folks were patiently waiting so uh the action of the committee i i is, is Ms. so i why do you want to state it restate it um or either understand <laughs> where we are, or would you like me to do that? Uh, I think I can. Okay. Uh, so on Damascus High School, um, certainly the um, clear request is for um, additional information to come back from MCPS in conjunction with the industry partners and the foundation partners around the future uh, steps and plans for um, addressing the this specific program on the automotive services as well as the other um, career pathways in the up county um, to have that information come back uh, mid-May before uh, final council action which just 
to be clear, probably we need to put that at the beginning of May. Yeah, I think beginning um, of May. Because council yeah. action will be mid-May, as I'm thinking out loud yeah. here. So um, I can work with them on specific and dates. sooner if you have it, but 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 no later than, than no later than the, the beginning of May. Beginning I'll, of May. I'll follow up with them specifically on that, yeah. um, and uh, and acknowledging that the planning funds that are remaining under non-recommended scenario A. Um, certainly um, provide for planning of the scope of the building that what the board has requested but with the understanding that um, again we'll continue to have this information regarding future career pathway options yep and you heard a commitment here that it, should you the board and MCPS and partners come with a different solution we're open to entertaining an amendment to the CIP to accommodate that solution obviously it all has to fit in together so okay so without objection yes on that piece there, you, I, I just, sorry the, I wanted to be clear clear that you that the committee is voting on the Damascus aspect or the whole all of the recommendations uh, I'm, I'm I think we can probably put it all together uh, but just wanted to be clear yeah with the entire unless you have a uh, um, we did not there was some there was some uh, so let's just vote on Damascus without objection uh, there was some discussion about Woodward's the auditorium issue with Woodward uh, are you able to speak to that briefly yeah. sure so yeah. our Damascus our partners for Damascus we you are you, you can step backwards switching gears here but thank you very much for coming and participating thank you, thank you Councilman Bradley so, so let's, I'll talk quickly yeah no you're fine let's, let's um, yes. so the um, issue here being that they're not going to have but they, the phase two will no longer include the auditorium space and what that will mean for <clears throat> thank you Miss LaGrange you can leave as well what that will mean for theater students people you know things that happen in the auditorium Correct. both both educational and otherwise so again fiscal constraints have you know based upon the bids that we received for both Woodward and mm -hmm. looking at crown so that both the two high schools together it is uh, the board actually acted on Tuesday to amend the scope of both of those projects so that there would be a phase three construction for Woodward High School for the new, the reopening of Woodward High School to include the auditorium and there would be a phase two for the new Crown High School to include the auditorium. So both of those would be built initially without the, the auditoriums and then looking at the next full CIP, uh, looking at, at, at how to uh, accommodate those in the next phases of construction. Um, as far as um, program space at Woodward, I'll talk Woodward because Northwood is going to no Woodward first. So there are spaces, Northwood does have a performing arts um, component to their school. And so as part of the first phase of construction for Woodward, we did include specialty spaces for them, including a black box theater that could accommodate some of that um, performance arts component. Clearly, if they are putting on, and, and I think Mr. Adams discussed this during the board meeting, that we will work with adjacent schools the same way we have to do it for uh, Northwood for their athletic facilities right. and their, um, you know, that program because that the fields will not be available to them um, in the beginning when they first um, are at that school. So we are working with yes. our transportation folks, our so. athletic folks, our. Um, you know uh, across the board to make sure that we can accommodate it on a day-to-day -day basis that they should be accommodated in Woodward with those spaces that we provided as phase one but if you're talking about a performance uh, spring play things like that we will be working with adjacent schools to make sure they can be accommodated there as well thank you do you have a question you want to ask on that yeah, I appreciate that, and I appreciate you looking for creative solutions. Obviously, it's $22 million. We're looking for space. I understand the reasoning. Um, you know, my concern here, of course, is that, as you mentioned, this is a, a performing arts academy program that students chose um, and that they were initially told that there would be one year at Woodward without an auditorium. And so now the prospect of they've decided where to go and what to do because of their passion uh, for the arts um, and, and they're facing a very different scenario here. Um, so I would, uh, and just acknowledging that, you know, the decision was made prior to know, for them, prior to knowing, and I understand budget constraints and, and we're having to be creative here. Um, but I just want to flag this one if there's, uh, 
uh, if there's, I'd like to ask MCPS if there's creative ways to limit the delay, to move up that, uh, to move up that third phase um, as much as is possible to limit the delay of that Woodward Auditorium, um, to have that on the list as we go into reconciliation um, of kind of priority issues that we take a look at and see if there is a possible solution there. Um, and then in addition to some of the uh, partnerships and other creative solutions um, that you mentioned in the black box and so on, it would be great to just kind of get a detailed rundown of what that could look like for students so that families can have a, a better understanding. Thanks. Uh, I, I, I do just want to clarify, I, I believe I heard you, Mrs. Mink, or Councilmember Mink, uh, reference reconciliation. The auditorium funding, my understanding, is not Remove. in the request, yeah. and so we wouldn't, like, the, it, it, it is not necessarily on the table for reconciliation. I think what might be, um, to, your, to your point, would be whether, uh, as was indicated in a future CIP cycle, it could be reintroduced. I think that would be the timing of when those um, kinds of decisions might be made. Yeah, I understand that it's not, I appreciate that. Yeah, I think that this is one that it, I would like to lift up as a priority issue for if there's a way to fit it in somewhere so that we have the option. Uh, and, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, the, council, can the council can't add funds that haven't been requested by the board. Yeah, so, t so passing the conversation back to MCPS as you have conversations with the board as we're moving forward, as you continue to look at the puzzle that we have before us, flagging this one as one that we are being true. I'm sure you're being inundated too, um, but that we are certainly being inundated about um, uh, since, again, students opted in thinking one thing, having another experience. And so a combination of one, the ask being if you're able to keep looking at that as, we, as you work on this puzzle, that would be much appreciated and or or I think and regardless um, the options that you talked about that you are that you are sorting through um, getting those to us and getting those out to families as clearly as possible so that students and families can really um, anticipate and envision um, what their arts experience is going to look like with those delays thanks all right well, good thing we have our our uh, board member here to take all this stuff back um, so uh, given the robust conversation uh, we would proposal is to move forward with the items that were summarized a couple, an hour and a half ago now I think and and uh, send that to the full council for consideration is without objection okay all right so thank you to our MCPS OMB partners to staff um, now we will move to our second item uh, which is the CIP discussion around the Wheaton Arts and Cultural Center I think this will go faster and then we'll Invite, invite folks to come down for that. Mr. Asant and Mr. Krupe from staff and so uh, really appreciate uh, you know this this is exciting project and Wheaton's you know my I think my all-time highlight for my kids being on the council will be when the Wheaton rec and library opened and there were you know hundreds of people standing out there and we got to bring our kids to you know and be there and for the ribbon cutting it's just a uh, one of the many great things going on in Wheaton um, so this project uh, will do a number of things establish an accessible and connected arts center in Wheaton and it also has affordable housing in it um, last year, we amended the CIP to uh, allow uh, Department of General Services to conduct a site, evalu conduct a site evaluation for co-locating the mixed-use development, and we approved the supplemental appropriation to allow MHP and the county to apply for a LIHTC housing credit or project. Very pre pleased with the progress. We've talked about this before. Uh, there's an upcoming, I think, town hall or, uh, on this, and the timeline sounds good, and we're we're talking about building a, a 40,000 square feet art center along with 320 multifamily units, 39 townhomes, 15,000 square feet of office space. Um, and uh, just really uh, wanted to lift up also Ms. Jenkins from the Arts and Humanity Council brought talked about this point about the importance of an art incubator space as part of this. And so we're really hopeful that that can be utilized. But uh, with that, I'll Mr. Krupe, if you want to go over the amounts and what the CE proposed and anything I missed. The county executive recommended a 38.36 year 
uh, total CIP for the project. Um, there would be a significant upfront appropriation of $23.65 million in fiscal year 25. Uh, the proposed project in the CIE's recommendation basically maintains the same uh, expenditure schedule as was approved in the previous CIP, the only difference being that the amount previously listed beyond six years has been put in fiscal years 29 and 30 and divided evenly between them. Thank you. And we uh, we also got a letter from our colleague, uh, Council Member Fani Gonzalez, District Council Member, earlier today asking that this be kept on track, and we agree. Uh, Mr. Asin, anything to add? Uh, just one short item, and appreciate uh, uh, the coverage, uh, Council Member Juwanda. <laughs> You're it, welcome. It, it, Did it's, I get an that exciting, right? it's an exciting project. Yeah. Um, uh, just one thing to add, as you know, this is a mixed-use project, and we, we do have a development partner um, who is actively uh, pursuing their financing, and of course the CIP is a big part of that. Um, in, in the meantime, uh, and you, you noted this, we uh, the county has brought on an arts consultant uh, to conduct some visioning sessions with the local arts community. Those sessions will begin in May. Uh, so as uh, our partner is working through their final design issues and financing issues, we'll be doing some public and, and outward uh, uh, facing and, and uh, outreach to the arts community. Um, Susan is, uh, Jenkins is part of that process, um, but we'll have an, a, an outside consultant in to, uh, to do a lot of that work uh, in, into the spring and probably into the summer as well. So that's something to look forward to. We hope to get a lot of uh, input on, on uh, how the final product will be developed. But uh, for right now, we're focused on a, a multitude of, of um, avenues to get the project underway. Appreciate that. Yeah, I think everyone's excited about this. Uh, anything from colleagues? So without objection, we'll concur with the county executive's request and uh, move this forward to full council. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. Uh, we are now on to our third item. Thank you for your patience. Our Montgomery College colleagues, come on down. Uh, Dr. Williams and Dr. McNair and Dr. Colette. Or Mr. Colette, I think. Are you a doctor yet? As well? Okay. Not, okay. Well, you got to have an honorary around somewhere yeah. around there. Um, but okay. There we go. Uh, good to see you all, and very pleased. Um, We've heard you state several times, Dr. Williams, on the record that enrollment is up, so really excited to dig into that a little bit today. Uh, good to see you, Dr. McNair, and, and, and everyone else. So why don't we start, and I'll, I'll turn to you. Um, uh, we're also looking forward to the East County campus open. We got the official invite, I think. Uh, you know, so it's, it's really happy. Or East County Center, excuse me, Center. Campus to come years from now. Uh, but we're excited about both, but we're excited about the East County Center opening. Um, so maybe you want, if you have your team, introduce yourselves and then kick it back to you for any to take the presentation away. I know you have the presentation. Just hit the hit the mic there. There we go. It was, so it was on that I turned it off because so I was cracking my fingers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So let's start with Dr. Campbell. Hello. Oh, can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Good afternoon. Michelle Campbell, Senior Vice President for Advancement and Community Engagement. Good afternoon. I'm Monica Brown, the Senior Vice President for Student Affairs. Good to see you. Hello, I'm John Hammond. I'm the Chief Analytics and Insights Officer. Sherwin Collette, Senior Vice President for Administrative and Fiscal Services. Hello, I'm Deidre Price. I'm Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs and College Provost. Wonderful. Great. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. So, um, it's always great to be in, in, in front of you. Thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you again for supporting the college's capital budget and your willingness to find resources for the theater arts and, and our, our IT. Um, We're I trying. Can see, it's not done yet. We're going to try. But, I, but, yeah, but yeah. the full so council did. Willingness to try to find. Yeah. Yeah. That's willingness to, to try to find those resources. Um, and, and as you see, and hopefully this representation further reifies the, the commitment of Montgomery College to Montgomery County. Um, several of the individuals here are they're responsible for driving institution-wide change and, and, and leading um, the immense divisions that are within the college. So just want to share that representation. You'll be hearing from, from all of them. And um, I know and we know that this was identified as an enrollment work session. I just want to spend the, the next you know maybe minute or two really centering this around around Montgomery College and kind of a holistic perspective. And we think about that, you know, we really think about we think about the people. 
and the people in terms of alumni like Shaquille Stewart, who now serves as executive director of the Silver Spring Stage, or Jackie Flores, who is a cell therapy operations manager at AstraZeneca, and people like Paul C., uh, a HVAC graduate, who is now project manager at Shapiro and Duncan, right? So when we think about those people, we're really grounded by these 10 year kind of aspirations that we have. We call them our transformational aspirations around three things council members around access, completion, and post completion success. So when we think about this, and while we're here to talk about enrollment, when we think about access and, and we're looking at creating a college going culture, and we talk about metrics, uh, we talk about how we're going to measure items, and we, we think about what it would be in 10 years to ensure that every single MCPS student and their family members have an educationally purposeful experience with Montgomery College by the time they're in seventh grade. Right? When we think about you know, what would it mean to increase the percentage of MCPS students who are coming to Montgomery College directly from high school? What would it, what would it be like to increase the number of and percentage of dual enrollment students you know, participating in Montgomery College while they're obviously at MCPS? So, so when we think about access, those are the things we think about. Um, and we think about how you support our transformational aspirations, right? how, how you provide with our budget, right? And how you give us the ability to keep tuition affordable. And tuition has only been increased one time in the last four years, right? And you contribute to that. When you think about reflecting on what you just said, Chair Juwando, uh, you providing us with the opportunity to be in the eastern part of our county, in East County, right? That's how you uplift and help us with, with access. And we think about completion, our second transformational aspiration. I won't read all of the pieces there, but really credentials that provide economic, social, and, and community impact. Right? So we think about increasing the, the number of students who graduate, but we also think about, about the impact, right? that every credential is going to have that type of impact, every credential is going to lead to a family sustaining wage. Um, and you do that, you do that by ensuring that we have an infrastructure to create that. Right, ensuring that we have buildings to create these awesome educational experiences, ensuring that we have an IT infrastructure to create these educational experiences that lead to you know, economic, social, and, and community impact. And, and last, uh, before I just share a few things about our current situation as it relates around enrollment, is, is post-completion success. And, and you know, some people look at this and they wonder why, why a community college would endeavor to impact these items and we know that as an, an anchor organization in this county, we know um, serving the county in the way we do, it's imperative that we look at trying to leverage Montgomery College to create social transformation. So when we think about post-completion success and we have these bold aspirations that really look at increasing the number of people who earn a family sustaining wage, like we have goals of helping to decrease the gaps that we see in poverty amongst racial groups, right? That's what Montgomery College has decided to set as its North Star. These transformational aspirations, and it's that context that we are here today and every day, and that context that I wanted to provide for our team to be able to share with you. So before you hear from the first presenter, I will share again, just to put a, a kind of a level of clarity on it, and you mentioned it, Mr. Chair, but we are up in enrollment fall over fall by 4%, about 3.8% as in your documents exactly, 5% for spring over spring, and that's the second spring in a row. Projections for this coming summer and fall are also up. The immediate enrollment rate for high school graduates is ticking back up. So that'll be the percentage of MCPS students who are immediately coming to Montgomery College. We know we have a, a challenge with that, with about a third of MCPS students not matriculating to a post-secondary education that has credits, a credit-bearing post-secondary education within 12 months. So I'm gonna repeat that, about the 14 to 15,000 students who graduate each year from MCPS, about a third of them do not, within 12 months, transition to a credit-bearing post-secondary education opportunity and the statistic doesn't get much better when you look 18 months out right so we have opportunities um, and we're seeing an uptick in that uh, and some as, as you know your college is the largest community college in the state of Maryland and 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 the most diverse we are the only Hispanic serving 
institution in the state of Maryland. 29% of our students identify as Hispanic or Latino. One in four of our students identify as African American or black. Right? We're also an Asian American, Native American, Pacific Islander serving institution, also as designated by the Department of Education. So we are, we are here to continue to serve. We are here to continue to move the county forward. Um, and, and on that note, I will share that we know um, that you deeply believe in Montgomery College and you support us. We also know that uh, it's definitely been a work session. So I've, I've asked the team to uh, really go through. Um, and I'm sure you will stop us we when, 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 when you want to. And if not, we'll answer all the questions at the end. But I've asked them to kind of keep it, keep it moving because I know you have the documents and, and you're all read up. So on that note, I thank you for the time, Mr. Chair, and I'll turn it over to our first presenter. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. All right. Uh, my name is John Hammond, Chief Analytics Insights Officer. I've got, I've got a lot of data here, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it you know, uh, uh, slow enough so we can understand it, but uh, keeping track of, of time. All right. So, um, so to give us some context, I want to start with a little bit of, of, of national and, and state data as we as we think about enrollment and, and how it looks at, look at Montgomery College. So when we look over the last you know 15 to 20 years. College, or nationwide college enrollment has has really seen a decline, um, and it, it's hit uh, community colleges more deeply than it has some of the four-year schools, especially during the pandemic. They were kind of the first to, to uh, see the biggest impact, but also in the last couple of years have seen the greatest you know growth back. Right, that's true nationally, and, and that's true for for Montgomery College as well. So if we look at the next side. This is looking fall by fall over the last five fall semesters, and you can see kind of the difference about what's been happening at community colleges to our four-year peers. Enrollment was declining more at community colleges, right, but also quicker to bounce back. So when you look instead at just uh, from fall to fall, look at the total fiscal year headcount um, for community colleges over the last 20 years, you can see that it went from 9 million, it hit a peak uh, around uh, 2010 and 11 million, and then the last couple years, it's hovered just below that, that, that 9 million mark. Um, that 2022 is the, the, the most recent national data we have. And the next slide, we see, if we look just at Maryland, we see a very similar picture, right? Again, the numbers are different, but that, that same idea that we were at 168, you know, back in, in 2003, it peaked in, in 2010, and now the last couple of years, um, we're seeing, seeing a little bit of a dip. When we look specifically at Montgomery College, right, the, the middle line there is our credit-bearing courses. That's the most uh, applicable to the previous two slides. But I don't want to talk just about our credit students, even though that's what gets nationally reported. You know, from when we think about how we're supporting the students in the in the county, it's really important to think about what we do in our workforce development and our non-credit classes. So the top line here is showing the combined credit and non-credit classes. And you can see a real similar trend right back in 2003. We're at 46,000. We peaked up around 62. In, in FY22, we had a, had a total headcount of, of just under 40,000. In 23, it's just over. And, and I will tell you, right, the, the numbers aren't final for 24 yet, but we'll be, we'll be slightly higher than that by the time fiscal year 24 is, is over. When we break this down by, by campus, we can see some, some kind of changes. Um, the important thing to, to note here is that the top line here is, is, is Rockville, our, our, our biggest campus. Um, Pre-pandemic, it was pretty easy to talk about which students were at which campus. But as soon as we started to have remote classes, students had the ability to be at multiple campuses at once without thinking about travel time or where they lived, where it was most, most convenient, which has been great. Right? We've been able to retain that even as bring on-campus students back. But it does mean that, that it's a little bit hard to compare 2010 data to, to 2023 data because students have this ability to take classes. If there's a particular course or professor they want that's not immediately available, we still maintain that remote ability to get, to get students the, the courses they need. Next slide. Just on that. Sure. I think I'm going to encourage colleagues, if you have a question, let's do it as we go. So if you have one, then we can, because um, I heard, I think there's a lot of slides. Yeah. Right? yeah so, so we don't have to come back. The, just the 17th out, so the, the, the trend line is the same all across, but the drop from 2012 to now at Rockville has been, it looks like it's been more precipitous than that the others. Is, is, is there any, do you have any reason of why you think that's the case? Yeah, I mean, so it, uh, again, pre-pandemic, like if a student was at, was at Rockville, um, it was uh, a, a bigger lift to get to one of the other two campuses, right? You know, the, the travel time involved. And if you needed uh, uh, 
a particular course, a lot of courses, almost every course is offered at Rockville, right? The, the two other campuses have fewer course offerings. So you go to the course where you, or to the campus where you get all the courses. So there's a natural drive to get people at, at Rockville. Now a student who can be at Germantown, even if they need a course that was only offered at Rockville, they can often take that course remotely. Yeah. And so we now offer that course uh, without the student having to be at that physical campus. So it's diversified where the students have to go without making them have to travel. Yeah. So Rockville's gone down, it's other campuses are going up, um, even though that might not reflect who's you know physically on physically. the campuses. Yeah. Appreciate that. The, the next slides are about uh, uh, high school enrollment, right? So this is students who enroll in the fall immediately after, after graduation. And looking at, at, at national data, you can see that, you know, for uh, the college going right to community college, you know, used to be around 20%. It's, it, too, has been dipping um, since the pandemic. And, and nationally, for the most recent data we have, which is the 2021 fall term, it, it's around 19%. We see Montgomery College, as Dr. Wim alluded to, that it has decreased, but you can see since the pandemic, it, it has come back up and we are around that national average now where, where we're seeing about 20% of, of, of our students coming in. Um, and part of the request is to, to see raw numbers. So in addition to those percentages, I want to put the, the raw numbers down, down there as well, um, which are a little bit hard to interpret right? because the, the graduating class at MCPS changes year to year. But we can get the idea that we're seeing you know, 2,500 students uh, a year starting immediately at Montgomery College. Dr. Williams talked briefly about our diversity, and, and that's something we're, we're, we're really proud of, right? Um, you can see the, the breakdown here and, and how it's changed over the years. One of the things that you have to uh, remember when you think about our, our percentages of, of diversity is that for any one that goes up, another percentage has to come down, right? So, we, you know, th these are not the wrong numbers. These are the percent of each, each part of the population. And so this will continue to be a, a net sum of 100. This is not every race ethnicity we have. This is our, our, our top five. But as, as we see increases in one, others, others automatically do, do decrease. Um, and uh, we do have some other uh, demographic slides at the end, right, about, you know, gender and full-time, part-time stuff, so, so um, th those are there for, for your review. These uh, next couple of slides are, are just to give some sense of the, the course of study for, for our students. So these are listed on this slide as the, the top five for, for each of those years. You can see consistently business and general studies are, are where the uh, bulk of our students uh, uh, go. Um, and as we change some of our, our, our uh, curriculum around here, we, we see some you know, increase, some decrease, right? But, but those numbers in the, in the top few seem relatively consistent. The next slide shows the, the you know, number six through 11 um, for, for each of those years as well. And then I want to talk just a little bit about, about our, our projections, right? So, so we use our projections to help us determine what our uh, uh, you know, budget is. We, we, we think carefully about what we need to, to incorporate in that. We've been using the same model for, for multiple years here. We use a lot of internal data in that model. Like, I mean, we keep track of our students, our retention rates, you know, lots of things about our own students. And then the outside pieces that we, we get in is we get uh, MCPS graduates, like we take the current year, right, um, of, of, of graduates, um, as well as the projections for the future years. Um, and then we use uh, things from, from the county, which are, you know, the, the population, um, as, as well as uh, the, the 12th grade enrollment projections um, for surrounding counties, including, including D.C. So we take all those things in to get kind of a one number number summary, and that's what I want to focus on, on here. Um, the, what I have graphed here is this is the one year out projection. I mean, we always project five years out, right? So the, the, the dotted line here is the one year out projection, and the solid line is our, is our actual. And so over the last, you know, decade or, or so here, our uh, actuals and our projections have been relatively close. Um, you see in 2014, that was about uh, a 6% off um, when, when we were there. It's been less than that all the way up until the pandemic. And the pandemic, you know, our projections um, s still were, were not wildly off. That was about 10.5% there. Um, and you can see that the, the projections have corrected, right, and, and came back down after we had the actual down. And so we're up a little bit from that. And, and again, my projection here uh, for where we'll end up on 24 is our actuals will be above that projection on, on FY24 as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Brown. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hammond. 
Okay, I'd like to share a bit about how we uh, got here as you think about our enrollment and that it is on the uptick. And just to talk a bit about uh, the student's life cycle journey. Um, and it's a visual representation of uh, how students access Montgomery College, how they move through to completion, and ultimately uh, the goal of post-completion success. Next slide, please. Um, and in terms of some of the activities, uh, we try to work across the college with a cross-functional uh, collaboration uh, to connect students, uh, to remove barriers, uh, to decrease the melt, if you will, and increase our yield, and refining our processes in ways that uh, streamline our onboarding, uh, as well as how students uh, move through the enrollment uh, cycle. And then in terms of uh, our outreach to segmented student populations, uh, our adult students, our international students, our Spanish uh, speaking students and ways that we are uh, marketing, as you'll hear a bit more about from Dr. Campbell, to uh, particular student populations and uh, those residents we seek to serve. Next slide, please. Um, and then to think about uh, how we uh, want to build uh, collaboration and support for students and assuring students that we want them at Montgomery College. Um, our You Belong Here campaign uh, is one of the ways that we talk about that, uh, thinking about our alignment uh, with our ATD work and, and our other enrollment efforts. Um, again, our international student population um, and ways that we partner with MCPS uh, to just highlight uh, the uh, programs that we have in the summer for our youth. Uh, we talk a lot about credit, but I want to highlight that program because students can get their student service learning hours um, by taking uh, and participating in those summer camps. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and then just thinking about uh, some of the expanded uh, opportunities that we have for outreach, uh, where we offer uh, information sessions in Spanish, both in in the high schools and throughout the community um, and, and anywhere we can uh, meet with community pe uh, members and encourage them to learn more about Montgomery College, even um, suggesting that students uh, spend their spring break coming to Montgomery College, uh, why spend your money elsewhere? Spend your time gaining knowledge about what Montgomery College can offer you. Um, and then, next slide, please. Um, looking at our application, um, the increase in the number of applications over the same time uh, a year ago, and you see um, the increase uh, in uh, each uh, session, each season, I should say. Um, and so that certainly speaks to what we're seeing in terms of the uptick in enrollment. And then finally, uh, again, and I, I did give away the whole spring break idea, but some of the other activities um, that we have uh, where we're looking at uh, our uh, branding and our marketing that uh, Michelle will speak to in just a moment. And then the technology that supports our work and our ability to uh, connect with students and to track our students. You'll hear a bit about um, our student success platform. And then the implementation of our Raptors Care initiative, uh, where we'll focus on our first generation uh, students and what we like to call our at promise students, um, just to really focus in on those students who, who are coming to us uh, as first generation students so that we can really connect with them and connect them with members of the college community. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to our next speaker. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Brown. Um, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about strengthening access and a couple of the ways that Montgomery College has been very intentional and strategic about um, opening the door for more students um, and reducing the cost of college for those students. So for dual enrollment specifically, um, our college, of course, has a, a wide variety of ways in which it serves high school students with post-secondary education opportunities while they are currently in high school. Um, 
one of the things that's most important about this is that it, it's it's all about the affordability of college and the opening of, of access doors for students um, by reducing the cost to students and families, not just of the tuition, but also associated textbook costs. Um, one of the things that's important, too, is that for dual enrollment opportunities that are delivered on site at the high schools, that additionally removes the burden of transportation costs. So this can provide a lot of additional opportunities and um, cost savings for, for parents and students. Um, and it also gives students a leg up when it, when they, it comes to the post-secondary opportunities they'll move into following high school. Um, one of the things in addition to the cost savings that we see with dual enrollment it, is that it builds students' confidence. It allows them to envision themselves in college settings. And it allows them to see what that, that future opportunity might be to finish a credential and then move into the workforce. You can see that the number of students duly enrolled has increased exponentially. We're seeing this trend across the country, of course, but we are seeing some great um, leaps and bounds happen at Montgomery College. And that, of course, is very exciting for us. One of the things that these data don't show, though, um, is that dual enrollment used to be something that was just for general education opportunities. And so now what we're seeing with dual enrollment and what we're, we're intentional about providing is a diversification of those opportunities for students, such that if they're interested in career education pathways, they have those opportunities alongside the Associate in Arts degree as well. You'll also see that at Montgomery College, we have increased the number of courses that are offered for dual enrollment. So again, along those same lines, um, going beyond those traditional offerings for dual enrollment students to have an opportunity to participate alongside um, traditional college students as they pursue their degree while in high school as well. And then another strategy that the college has deployed to reduce the burden of textbook costs and college costs more broadly um, is the implementation of Z courses and Z programs. Um, we offer Z courses that eliminate the financial burdens of mounting textbook costs. And since 2014, our Z courses have saved students a total of approximately $14 million in textbook costs. And if you see those articles like I do, textbook costs continue to increase. So institutions do have to be very mindful of the ways in which they serve students, uh, not just reducing that cost, but ensuring that there is that um, accessibility of materials and resources for college courses. Um, at all phases. And um, just like Dr. Hammond mentioned earlier, we do have an expansion of online courses and programs at the college. It is increasingly important that we have the same kind of access and um, innovative approach to the materials and textbooks that are required for those courses so students can have what they need in time to uh, meet their course goals. Can I just pause you there? I, of course, stepped away when I, where I wanted to ask a question, but I, we went over the dual enrollment slide. Mm -hmm. yeah and how it's trending upward. Um, you know, we had some conversation early in our previous session that though we're trending upward, there are some, we are still not at the percentage of other parts of the state uh, as far as how many students are dual enrolled given our size. Uh, from your perspective, I know there's some, there's a one big limitation is that it can't happen from MCPS educators in their classrooms on campus, whereas in other counties like Frederick, they can do that. They can qualify for credit and not have to physically go to Montgomery College or um, but from your capacity standpoint what's the ceiling for where you all could handle um, you know is this you know we we've gone up a little bit every year so it looks like 25 just under 2600 last year uh, are we gonna are we on pace to exceed that uh, what, what is the what are the limiting factors from so, your perspective. Absolutely. So I'm going to start, and then, and then Dr. Price can share a little bit about the, the model and how they're offered, because it is at the college and high school. And, um, but really quickly, and um, mentioning it is, we have some community colleges in the state um, who are so kind of um, dependent on dual enrollment that it's actually, it's, it's a little bit concerning. So when you ask what's the capacity, mm -hmm. it's it's really it's a both so and. Maybe not a. a, it's a yeah. So when you say so, it's it's like it might sound great, like wow, we have you know thirty percent of our population is dual enrollment. Like look at our dual enrollment. That but that's thirty percent of your population, which means your institution is sustained by a third of it is is these students who. Right. Um, so if that changes, so when we think about it at Montgomery College, we're thinking about both both and. It's not how much can you know we change and alter. 
and, and, and leverage as a funding model, because that's what unfortunately has been leveraged as a funding model where people are not coming to college in certain demographics. So like, well, let's get dual enrollment students. And people are kind of relying on that. But we do see an opportunity to grow enrollment and access to education just widely and broadly. And with that, we think the number will increase. But if we thought about this, if we grew enrollment to 50, 60,000 and the percentage of dual enrollment stayed the same, that's a larger end, right? So it is a so it is something that we consider, Chair Jawando. Um, but we definitely, I think we there's a point where you, you get to be um, in a little bit of a danger zone. Um, and well, it looks cautious. like we're nowhere near that, right? You know. <laughs> no, we're we're not, we're not. But I just wanted to share the kind of a more philosophical no, no, I appreciate and practical that. framework that's before that. Dr. Price shares a little bit more of the program. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am relatively new to Montgomery College. I started in January, but from what I know so far, and I can tell you, I bring, thank you. Oh, it's very exciting. Um, for, from my perspective, I am somebody who comes from a dual enrollment background. I was a dual enrollment student myself in high school. It provided me with immense opportunities to try something out new that I wasn't sure that I would be able to do. Um, I will say that um, Montgomery College has a lot of different ways in which it packages dual enrollment. And I love the question of what is the capacity because um, we are are thinking of very bold strategies to try to open that door a little bit further to get more students in. The, in, in. Um, and when I'm meeting with my colleagues across the state um, to talk through how they're doing dual enrollment, um, I am confident that the way in which we are, are proceeding into this space is the right approach. Um, it is important to be conservative and not overestimate um, the, the solution that dual enrollment will provide um, with regard to a larger enrollment strategy plan. Um, but I, I do think, you know, when we're thinking about what we want to do with dual enrollment at the college, through the early college program, middle college, P-TECH, whatever it is, um, the goal is really making sure we're tapping into new populations, not simply the ones that would come to us anyway, right. because of course we would just be um, shifting when they're starting, not really increasing our total base. And, and the goal for us really is to, to reach the students who might not end up in college at all. And so um, that, that is the center of what we're doing. As far as the on-site opportunities for faculty or teachers in the high schools to become qualified to teach college courses, that is work that we are doing. It's work that we will continue to work to expand. Um, and, and one of the things I would just clarify is, is those instructors would need to meet, of course, the, fa the qualifications for the faculty to teach the college courses. Um, I know that that is also done differently across the state, um, depending on the institution. So I'm still learning, growing new for sure, but um, am excited that we will be growing, I'm sure, dual enrollment. Um, to, to benefit all students. Yeah, and I'll just flag for our staff, uh, let's come back to this issue. We, you know, it's a kind of, I think, good conversation for both MCPS and Montgomery College, just to t like as you're figuring out what your total enrollment is, and, and I love the idea of it being additive, not just, not just switching students that would already come to Montgomery College, uh, but it's one of my favorite graduations every year. I, I, I hope it's on my calendar this year. I, I never want to miss it. It's a, it's a huge room of awesome students who are going to do awesome things, but I would love to talk more uh, once we get to the budget about how your strategy as you develop it to get to students that aren't currently uh, looking at this as an opportunity or looking at colleges or post-secondary as an opportunity at all. So, uh, so that's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I know I, when it took us back, we can go back to where you were. Oh, absolutely. And I think this would be last for Z course. Um, so I'll just hand it over to Dr. Campbell. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about our marketing and communication strategies as they exist uh, today, and then also talk about what we have planned uh, going forward. We have some great things planned. So at Montgomery College, our marketing and uh, media plan is a comprehensive plan. It includes digital as well as traditional media and marketing, and we do a lot of social media uh, marketing and, and whatnot as well. So what you see on this slide is just a, a, a short list of some of the strategies and ways in which we market to our prospective students, their families, uh, and our community. Next slide. So our marketing and communication strategy is also one that includes elevating uh, some of the programs that are under Dr. Price, uh, which include academic offerings, but also workforce development and continuing education. Uh, and those offerings include certifications in high demand, high wage fields throughout the county. 
Uh, we also do a lot of contract training uh, for businesses who call Montgomery County home. And we design those, uh, those courses and those certifications specific to the needs of our respective businesses. Uh, we also offer a large summer youth program in the summer. I'm, I have children of, of this age, and so I'm sure they'll be enrolling in this program come summer. Uh, and that is also a great offering uh, that we have at the college. And we offer introductory courses uh, at many of our community engagement centers that are located throughout the county. Next slide. So this is, while this isn't an, an all-inclusive list, this is just a very brief uh, sort of highlight of some of the key messages that we, we kind of tease out and, and put some more, some more meat behind in, in our marketing, our current marketing and communication strategy. So that includes quality of education that they can get at Montgomery College for nearly half the cost if they were to start a four-year institution. Uh, we highlight the support and the opportunities uh, that we offer at Montgomery College for students to fund their education. We have a lot of scholarship opportunities available for students uh, and also paid internship opportunities, which is fantastic. Uh, we have a very, as uh, Dr. Hammond indicated, we have a very diverse student population. We're the most diverse student or community college in the continental United States. And so uh, when we are developing and designing our messaging, we have to keep that in mind, uh, the diverse audiences that we're speaking to and ensuring that our messages and our visuals are speaking to our, our diverse student populations. Next slide. So when we plan our key messages and creative assets, and I just mentioned this, it's, it's very important for us to choose images and creative assets in content that speak directly to key audiences. So uh, some of our marketing uh, right now is broader. It's more of a, an evergreen approach where it's marketing uh, Montgomery College in general. Uh, but when we think about things like dual enrollment, like Dr. Uh, Price mentioned, and we think about how do we talk to families and, 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 and get messages to, uh, in, into uh, the K-12 space, uh, that is a very different message and a very different visual than what it would be if we're marketing to adult learners, for example. So we have to keep all of that in mind when we're building our strategies. Next slide. All right, so with all of that said, as we, I'm also fairly new to the college. I've been uh, in this role since, since June, so coming up on a year, very excited to be here. And so as I um, we assess kind of where we've been, where we are currently, and where we're headed, looking towards the future. It is very essential that we continue to increase brand recognition of Montgomery College within Montgomery County and beyond. Uh, and so we intend to do this through the development of a new uh, strategic marketing and communications plan that's very aligned to our uh, enrollment management plan that Dr. Uh, Brown mentioned as well as the college's strategic plan and transformational aspirations of access completion and post-completion success. And so over the next couple of years, uh, the college will be working closely with uh, an agency called Interact Communications. Uh, and this is to assist us in refreshing our brand and elevating the college's presence throughout the county and beyond. Uh, Interact is a women-owned business. They are a leading marketing and branding agency in the two-year college space, and we're very excited about, about the work we're going to be embarking on here very soon. Next slide. So this is just a, a brief highlight or summary of what that work is going to entail. Uh, it's a, a three-phased approach. Phase one is essentially conducting a marketing and communications audit, audit of what we currently do. That's from what's in the market, doing some market research, talking to internal and external stakeholders, uh, conducting focus groups, doing surveys, uh, and really getting an understanding of where we are today and how we can refresh our brand identity and architecture, uh, which will hopefully result in a new, uh, a new and refreshed brand story. So that's creative assets, messages that we use, content, and how we tell the story of Montgomery College to the diverse communities that we serve. Phase two is really bringing, developing a new strategic marketing strategy that's really aligned to the enrollment, the bold enrollment goals that we have. 
uh, and, and bringing that all, all to life. And then lastly, phase three is really the implementation of the new plan, uh, doing some message testing. So that's where uh, when we think about our target audiences, we have specific messages that we're going to test and market uh, to those audiences to see how those perform. And then we'll make adjustments along the way as far as how is that um, impacting enrollment uh, and uh, the, the goals that we have with, with enrollment. And that concludes my section. Just before we move on, wel welcome as well. I think Thank you. probably oh, maybe your first time before the council. Yes, I was here for MCTV uh, a few a few weeks back, but yeah. yes, first the um, before the committee. Just are there? Do you have? A, I know you'll develop with this with the team, but going in, are there kind of like metrics you want to see go up, or, or like things that you're looking for? Uh, you know, populations you want to have increased visibility with. You know, I'm just curious about that. Yes, so we do have um, an, an enrollment goal of increasing enrollment by 12% uh, uh, in the next several years. And so that's obviously front and center to uh, how we design this, this plan and um, the support that uh, our marketing plan gives to our enrollment services team. <coughs> When it comes to who do we intend to market to, that's kind of where the market research will come in and the data. Uh, and, and we really do have to partner with John and, um, and Enrollment Services to look at what is our current, like what is the current state and where, where are we seeing pockets where we could absolutely increase more. So adult learners may be, be one mm -hmm. of those. And, and where are we seeing high concentrations of of certain populations of adult learners in parts of the county. Uh, and so we may decide that we want to deploy certain messages to ter certain target, target uh, uh, potential student populations in specific areas based on what sort of comes out of all of this. Appreciate that. And, and this is, we've been having a lot broader conversation about aligning around career pathways around the county and, and scaling that up as a comprehensive you know, P, six P, whatever, however far you want to go, P employment um, <laughs> system. Uh, and so I, I'm very excited about this thing. It's good timing for all of that. that. Hopefully we can link up all these conversations and just be driving them all together. So awesome. Thank you. Continue. So as we turn our attention to the next slide, I think, um, and perfect. So as you've heard it, uh, and clearly it takes a village to um, to drive the changes in enrollment as we as we've described, we began with the data. The next sets of steps, as we talk, talked about the enrollment management strategies, the ways in which we're making and continuing to make uh, Montgomery College accessible and affordable, uh, and the role marketing plays an important next step. Gets us to uh, how do we how do we then uh, use technology to help us from uh, managing engagements with prospective students to that when they when they leave us and beyond, um, and the need for a, a customer relationship management system, a basis for our student success platform, uh, is at the heart of that. How do we, in, in meeting the needs of our students, um, and again, students even con uh, conceptualize as those who don't even yet know that they want to come to Montgomery College as we reach them, and begin to uh, shepherd them through the process, that we're ensuring that we don't lose touch with them, uh, and we engage them all the way through their journey uh, with us and beyond as they may come back to us, not only as, as alums, but certainly maybe to upskill, right skill, reskill, uh, we see the need for uh, the enabling technologies to support that entire process uh, of the engagement, engagement through from recruitment uh, through to retention, all those facets to be able to track and have data about those touch points. We need to be able to measure uh, what the ex those experiences are so that we can by knowing better, we can do better and be better about uh, ensuring that each experience, each touch point with a prospective student, an existing student, uh, is what it needs to be, that they are being advised in the right ways, that we are attending to their needs uh, for supports uh, to ensure their success and for their families as well. And also in, in, the, in this, in this, on this platform uh, that we've just begun to, to develop, it's also about enhancing our ability to use data more effectively and inform 
each of those data points. Um, and as part of the, the platform, it, in, it includes um, analytics uh, and insights that take us to those uh, predictive uh, uh, spaces as well, so that we're able to, to know more deeply the types of experiences and how we may adjust meter uh, so that the experience is, is optimal uh, for each student uh, across, across their journey with us. Um, so this comprehensive approach, as I noted, um, is really a full service, high touch, uh, supports a, what I like to describe as a sort of a white glove engagement with our students and, uh, and, uh, and again, students from, from, the, from, from those who we are seeking to engage and starting to touch uh, all the way through their, 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 their engagement and their time uh, at the institution and it's really not only on the front side, but it's a really important element in supporting our ability to retain uh, our students uh, as well. Um, and so I'll just kick it yeah. back to so Dr. Williams. Thank you, team. And as we, as we close in the next minute or two, I want to end with uh, what we started with, and this is the impact that we, that we seek to have, um, the impact that I, I know that you and, and so many others in the county want us to, to have in terms of access, completion, and, and post-completion success. And, and while I'm hopeful we answered your questions, I'm also hopeful that we have put this around a, uh, a larger context in terms of not only uh, what is happening with numbers, but how the way in which we are stewards of resources and how we are leveraging the resources that we have and the resources that we seek to really move towards impact um, through through technology, through marketing, um, through people and human capital strategy. And on that last note, uh, I will share with you who's also in the audience when we talk about impact is Dr. Kimberly McNair, who is our excuse me, Associate Senior Vice President for Enrollment, right? This is a role that we did not have um, when I joined the college, uh, not a person in the role at least, right? So when we think about how Montgomery College not only wants to have impact, but how we're leveraging the resources that we're extremely thankful for uh, in a way to actually get us towards that impact, hopefully this presentation today has illustrated a little bit of that. So we thank you for your time, and as always, we thank you for your support. And if there are additional questions, comments, we'd love to embrace those. Well, thank you. I, and this was a, I appreciate the, what thought that went into the presentation, but also how quickly you moved through it. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, you had you said you mentioned the twelve percent goal. Just over how where did that come from? When was it to be set? And uh, and over how many years? Like what's the what's the upward trajectory towards that? So I'm how, many Dr. 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 how many students are today in Montgomery College right now, this moment? A little over 40,000, right? 40,003. For fiscal year, 40,003-ish. 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, and I'm going to ask Dr. Uh, Brown to really talk about that because I think this is an exciting opportunity in terms of the length of the, the plan, the kind of really immediate goals, and then looking towards the long term. So, Dr. Brown? Certainly. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The idea is to set a bold goal. Um, for what we know we can do and also what we need to do uh, to increase enrollment. Uh, when we talk about the 12 percent, and uh, Dr. McNair and I talked about this meeting with the senior vice president to think about uh, uh, what that would be. And so we looked at uh, you know where we were at the time and the, the uh, strategies that we would put in place and also thinking about it over a two-year period. Um, to do some immediate work and start to see uh, uh, an immediate increase in enrollment, and we're seeing that. But then thinking about it over a long, a longer period as well, um, and this includes our credit and non-credit students, um, so that we can build a bridge between uh, students who are taking credit classes and those who are taking non-credit classes, um, so that 12 percent is inclusive of both. So over a two-year period? Over a two-year period in this first iteration, first iteration of our uh, strategic, so, I'm sorry, our enrollment management So the goal uh, is 12, up 12% 12 in two years? Yes, sir. Got it. And I like that. That is bold. So that's bold. just under 5,000 more students, so that would get you around 44, 45,000 students. Then that's the goal. That is the goal. All right. I like I like bold goals. We all do up here. You know? Yes. Um, and the, the other question I had, and then I'll turn to Councilmember Albernaz. Uh, the race and ethnicity slide was interesting to me and kind of ties into 
uh, I think uh, everything you're talking about. It, it looked like uh, Asian uh, enrollment has has been steady for like the last 10 years, it looks like around 12, 13 percent. Um, we saw a slight dip in uh, immigrant enrollment, but still around 10, 9 percent, not much. But the, 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 the big changes were white population going down um, from 26 in 2014 to 19 now, and then the African-American black, black and Latino kind of going crisscrossing, Latino going up and black kind of trending down, but it looks like it might be trying to tick up here at the end here. So anything you all are thinking about in relation to that and how you're going to market and like just trend lines. And I know this is only a 10 year period. I don't know what it would look like, before, you know, prior to that, but yeah, not, no, not a decrease in numbers, right? Yeah. The enrollment has gone up, but who's coming, who the, who the people are has, has slightly changed. So, so you know, I'm, uh, part of that's you, reflective so, of us just changing as a community. Uh, yeah, well, and that, and thank you uh, for that lead in. I'll turn over to, to, to Dr. Hammond or Dr. Brown after this. But quickly, I want to say it, it provides us with an opportunity to look at equity focused and data informed approaches to enhancing access to education, or, we, you know, some people we call enrollment, right? Because we don't want the increase in, let's say, our Hispanic or Latino population to go up just because there's more people identified as Hispanic or Latino. It doesn't necessarily mean we're serving that community or any community well. It's just by sheer nature of the fact that there's more people who identify in a certain population. Right, so when I look at this, and I know we look at, and you know, Dr. Hammond can talk more about the long term um, in terms of history, it's really how do we equitably serve the populations who are, who are here? So, and I'll, for any further, yeah, right. I mean, so to answer the question about the, the longer term, and one of the reasons why I only went back to 2014 on that slide instead of further back is because, you know, race ethnicity is, is, is a complicated thing, and we have changed, I mean, by, and by we, I mean the U.S. Department of Education has changed how we have to re report that, right? So the the kind of behind the scenes piece from, from how a student identifies by both the race and ethnicity has changed. The, the biggest change, in, in, in fact, from the pre-2014 is uh, a student who would identify as um, Hispanic and black, for example, would have been categorized as two race in the, uh, before 2010, right? And, and now they're categorized as Hispanic, right? And so when you look at those trend lines over longer than 10 years, you, uh, it takes some nuance to understand, you know, is it people just changing the, how they're being identified or is it really a change in the population for, for who's coming? And we continue to see that because, you know, even though it didn't make the, the slide, we still have two or more races as an option on our uh, uh, on our application. And even though we know, you know, from looking at the kind of demographics and stuff that that population is growing, we don't see more people selecting that, which is partly maybe because of who is serving, but also partly because of how students are choosing to self-identify in the, in the race ethnicity. So the fact that there's a lot of, I would say, complication in how people identify when they apply to the college, we have to have that as kind of a backdrop as, as how we think about how we interpret this this data. Um, but but I will let, let uh, uh, either Dr. Ryan or Dr. Campbell talk a little bit about marketing pieces on, and how we may do, do some distinguishing on that. Marketing pieces. Well, I mean, this is this is obviously a very important point because the way that we market to to certain populations, the languages that we use. I mean, much of our our um, our uh, marketing right now is tailoring to the diverse communities that we serve and it's something that when we go through this process of a of brand refresh and looking at what we do now part of looking at and assessing what our current strategy is and the the success of it or the areas where we may need to make some changes is to look at where are we not serving you know the community well or where where are we falling short and where do we need to uh focus more, but to the enrollment management piece of it is what are our goals? Are we looking to increase uh, the percentage of adult learners, for example, in, in, in certain spaces? If so, then that needs to be part of the strategy. If we're looking to increase our dual enrollment population by a certain percent to contribute to that 12% goal, that also has to be a factor in how we're developing the marketing plan. I would add that enrollment isn't just about who we attract and bringing in 
new people. It's about how we retain people. And so having programs that uh, support our students, uh, students of color, and, and all students, as, as, as we know, uh, um, you know, uh, every uh, program that we have that is specific to a particular student population, it benefits all students. So we have our Presidential Scholars Program that I'll mention that is for uh, any and all students who uh, are focused on increasing the number of African American male students and their success at Montgomery College, but then um, on to their post-completion success by being able to move into high-wage earning positions and careers. Um, and so being bold about not only uh, uh, increasing enrollment, but retaining um, students and making sure they are successful and, and speaking to uh, their needs and meeting them at their point of needs. We're looking at our parenting students and making Montgomery College a more, uh, a more family friendly environment so that our parenting students feel they belong and see themselves there. And so that's, you know, a big part of uh, sustaining uh, and retaining our students in a way that also speaks to enrollment and making sure we are uh, identifying and seeing them and providing uh, opportunities and support for them, again, meeting them at their point of need. I really appreciate that, uh, Dr. Williams saying, like, look, we're a diverse county, so we're going to have, hopefully, reflect that, but <clears throat> being intentional about uh, the groups and subgroups and speaking to them appropriately, supporting them once they're there, getting them enrolled. Uh, one of the most powerful things that I went to when I put the Germantown campus is I think you all hosted a couple of years ago, you may do it every year, all the young black male students from uh, the Maryland from male all students the of state color state community yes. colleges. Like that was a powerful room. Yes, uh, and, and a, you were a wonderful speaker. Well, I wasn't going to say that, but thanks. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, and I just think taking that care when you when you are the most diverse community college in the country, special care has to be taken in making sure we're meeting the needs of all the diverse populations, both in speaking to them appropriately, but also retaining and and making sure they succeed. And and then obviously, and so I'm assuming as part of this, there'll be goals and sub goals within that five thousand based on based on who's there, I would hope, you know. So um, turn to Councilmember Albernaz. Thank you so much. Um, headline here is Montgomery College is doing really fantastic work. No surprise, just very, very impressed as usual. Uh, just a couple of questions. Do we have, and I think we've shared, you've shared this data point before, but the percentage of students who are the first in their families to go to college? So I'm going to, Dr. Hammond, that's, uh, it's a, Interesting question, uh, Councilmember Albernaz, um, because people are operationalizing that in a different way. Um, for the first generation, you were very succinct in you know first to go to college. Um, this idea of first generation is what is kind of used in higher education and as being kind of nuanced mm -hmm. to are you the first to receive a degree? Are you the first to receive a four-year degree? Oh. If your parent, you know, if you know, went to and for a semester, are you still the first in your family to go to college or not? Yeah. So just to, so I just want a level of nuance there, but Dr. Hammond can can speak to that. Um, well, I, I appreciate that. No, I'm the, I'm the definition guy. So, so, so you weigh in on this. It's, 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 it's spot on. So. Um, our, our numbers change depending on how you you know kind of define that. But when we ask the question to our students, just as a survey question, where we say, "Do you consider yourself first gen?" Well, we don't define it. <laughs> um, we get about fifty percent of our students saying that. So again, slightly different uh, definitions will yield slightly different uh, results. But about half of our students are our first generation by by almost any measure. That's important. That's really cool. Um, um, and then, do we have a gender breakdown? I didn't see that. But it's probably in there somewhere. It is. Um, it is off the top of my head. I feel like it's 5248. Um, but I'd be going from. It's one of the slides in the additional information it's, behind uh, towards the end. The slides on top of the slides. Correct. Yes. Right. <laughs> the appendix. The after. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is it? Do you have it? 53%. Yeah. 53% female, 46% male. Yeah. 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 Got it. So, okay. Thank you. That's pretty even. Um, Thank you. I was curious about that. I, I love the emphasis on student life. You know, I know you all have so many different activities. I'd love to see athletics in the slides um, because it's such a, a, a wonderful, you know, placemaking activity. And Montgomery College is really competing 
regionally and nationally. Um, and so that would be a really cool thing to highlight. Um, I was not aware of the summer youth program. I'm going to look into it. We were comparing notes with Councilmember Jawando um, to see what's available. Putting in a plug for summer athletics um, and sports camps. I can tell you, you all have fantastic facilities that um, you should be taking better advantage of. These are you know, revenue-making opportunities for the college, but also wonderful enrichment activities. And you would uniquely be able to make them a little bit more affordable than what some families have available to them, which would be yet another way of introducing the next generation of students to various campuses um, in a way that could be really intriguing. Um, I've shared this story publicly before. I transferred to the University of Maryland my sophomore year, and if I had to do it all over again, I would have just gone to Montgomery College my freshman year. Um, and so I think, you know, highlighting those personal experiences, and I love, Dr. Williams, when you started with the, the stories of three of your graduates, um, I, I, I've, I've encouraged you to do that for a while. I, that was awesome. Um, so continue to do that uh, because that makes it very real for all of us and the public, you know, people that have been extraordinarily successful recently, um, which I think is fabulous. Um, I had a question about the alumni network. Uh, I know we have one. I know we're engaging with them. Um, you know, my mom and dad are alum, um, which I talk about often. But just uh, highlighting a little bit about those activities and what's in the works there, because those are obviously our strongest champions by far, people who've had the experience themselves. And, and, and thank you, Councilmember Albernaz. And that is actually under Dr. Campbell's portfolio, uh, one of the many, many things. And we have an alumni event coming up. We always have an alumni event coming up. But we have one of our biggest coming up. So we'll make sure we, we get that to you. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Campbell to share a little bit more detail about the Alumni Association. Yes, so we do have a very active alumni association. They hold their a separate 501c3 status. Uh, and we have three staff that uh, kind of oversee alumni relations and part of their job beyond just engaging alums it, and, um, and keeping them active is uh, fundraising for, for alumni uh, related activities and for our students, our current students. So uh, we have, I, I don't want to misquote the number of, of alums we have in our, our current database, but it's, it, I feel like it's close to 100,000 or over. Uh, so uh, we do actually have a for, for a two-year institution, a, a pretty large alumni program, so. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, excited, and, um, you know, whatever we can do to continue to support you guys, we're going to try to do. So thank you. I yield back to you, Mr. Schumer. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Mink. I just wish everything worked as well as Montgomery College did. This is this is fantastic. So thank you all so much for your work and you 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 know you're presenting um, such well thought through and responsive uh, plans and strategies and the data and like and all of this and um, and and it's it's. Um, I keep thinking about how your operating budget, you're doing this all, you're asking for us for, for like a maintenance of effort operating budget, you know? So just very much appreciated. Um, one side note, I thought it was, this, I think this was in one of the kind of extra slides too. I thought it was really interesting. Maybe it's not that interesting, but it was interesting to me that the percentages of those who are attending part-time and full-time over the whole graph, the entire, you know, all, all 20 years that are shown on the graph are just like remarkably consistent, like two thirds part-time, one third full-time. What is with that? Is that is that true? Is that like consistent across all community colleges over time? I mean, despite you know ch some demographic changes and despite changes in like the career and workforce world, I just I was so surprised by how consistent that was. Thank you, Councilmember Mankin. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Hammond to follow up about a national perspective and even farther back uh, in terms of Montgomery College. But I think it really it speaks to the. Um, beautiful diversity of the students who, who we serve um, and, and what's going on in their lives. Uh, you've heard a little bit about, and I know, um, Councilmember Albernaz, you've been to the mobile market. Yep. And I've shared with the council before, with this committee before, you know, the, based on the last administration of a basic needs survey, um, that we had 36% of our students identified uh, a level of food insecurity in the last 30 days, 36%. 14 to 18 percent because we offer different um, instruments. Uh, 14 to 18 percent of our students are parenting students. All right, about one in five of our students are Pell recipients, and of that 20 percent of our students, the average income annual income for those students is $28,000. All 
right? So I think this part-time, full-time, and I know Dr. Hammond had more to share, really represents um, the, the diversity and, and, and the realness, the lived experiences, and the opportunities for changing lives that Montgomery College provides. And on that note, I know Dr. Hammond can share a little more. Yeah, no, I appreciate the question. And, and, and it is remarkable that it has stayed so consistent despite all the different changes that we've seen in our student population and, and the economy um, and, and everything else. It is not the, the norm. I mean, we can find community colleges not far from us that have, you know, 80% full time. We can find other ones that are, you know, almost 90% part time. Um, and so I think it, it really represents kind of the, the a reflection of the county, right? I mean, we have a lot of people who are coming to Montgomery College for lots of different reasons. And, you know, at any given given time, when we look at the students who first start in here, a lot of them start as, as you know, full-time students. So when they when they first come in, you know, the, the 18 to 20 uh, bracket. But those are often here and done within two years, right? And, and, and that's the goal. But then they also have a lot of students who come in knowing that it's going to take them much longer, right? And those students that come in part-time stay here much longer, right? So even though a preponderance of our new students come in full-time, over the longer term, we end up with this, you know, about two-thirds that, 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 that are part-time. And that has to do with those that, that Dr. Williams mentioned. Some are parents, right, and, you know, doing full-time is not possible. Some do it for monetary reasons. They, 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 they can't afford to take as, as many classes. Some are doing it because they really want to fit this in around, you know, work time or, or other obligations in, the, in, the, in their lives. So we do kind of track and, and talk to students, but, but this represents, for the most part, what, what students, you know, want to do for, for their collegiate experience. Well, I certainly feel very proud of those numbers here because we have um, enormous and growing enrollment numbers and, um, and expanding campuses. And so I think as we look at that share of part-time students, a lot of that growth, that then if, we, if, we're, if, this, if this is not the same breakdown than we're, that we're seeing in other jurisdictions, I would assume that a lot of that growth in the, in the part-time numbers is because you all have made Montgomery College accessible to more people than, uh, than colleges accessible to another location. So that's fantastic. Um, and I'll just note that as things move forward, I'm going to continue to speak it into, into existence, but the money is going to do that too, uh, with the East County campus. Um, I, I look forward to hearing about your strategy for outreach there. And um, you know, as you're thinking about working with a community, building out a facility and programming that's responsive to the community, uh, it would be great to, for us to kind of follow along with the, the good work that you're doing there. I know, of course, we have a little bit of that with the Education Center. And as we do check-ins, and we'll get to, to hear about that too, but I think it's an exciting opportunity as you move forward with the campus um, for us and for the public to get a, a view of the strategies that you all are employing for that type of outreach. Thanks. Absolutely. I like We like forward thinking. I, I, I want to ask the, the program that we have in the state to provide tuition for community, every student that graduates over a certain GPA, I think it's 3.2.5, I don't know what it is. Uh, Susan, is it 3.0? It's a, something around there. How is that going? Yeah, what's what's? How are we taking our students taking advantage of that? Is it working well? You know, I've heard mixed reviews. I will. Um, I'm going to pass this to the person who can you know answer it most appropriately, which I think is Dr. Brown. She can start us off. Um, so. so we're talking about the the promise. Yes, Maryland promise. Yes, scholarship. so the Maryland promise scholarship. I would say um, it's getting better. Um, one is because now the colleges have um, oversight of it and, and we're able to um, um, get out to the students a lot quicker and sooner than uh, when it was coming through uh, one source, MHEC. So now that the colleges have the responsibility, uh, we anticipate uh, it being used, more of the money being used because we know the needs are there, we know we, students um, can benefit from it, and so that is our goal now that we, uh, in, in each community college, not just Montgomery College, but all 16, uh, we are now the ones who are responsible for uh, getting the information out and getting the, the money out, and so we uh, expect to see uh, more of that money used because we certainly know that uh, there are students who uh, need it. Yeah, and when did that change? That changed th this, this year. This is the first okay. year um, that we have the ultimate responsibility. Coming up this fall. I'm sorry. Is that coming up this fall? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'd love to, Mr. Krupe, come back on this. Uh, and if you, could, you all could prepare 
just like since it's been into existence, I don't know, it's three or four years now. I can't, I can't remember. Just how many, what, how many students have used it? I know there sure. were problems, and just kind of where we are, the, sure. the trend line on that. Uh, Councilmember Albernaz and I introduced on Tuesday the Child Investment Fund. Uh, Councilmember Mink is a co-sponsor. We think it, that will put eighteen hundred dollars in an account uh, that's invested, and then in eighteen years, one of the four allowed expenses of that fund uh, for a county resident is educational expenses. Um, so we're, we're, we're investing in Montgomery College's future enrollment growth, uh, and, as well as other institutions, hopefully. But um, it's, it's one of those things we're very excited about. And, uh, but I wanted to see how this program was working just in the context of, so if we could follow up on that. Um, anything else from colleagues? Okay, well, as, as was stated by my colleagues, we're so pleased with the work and appreciate the presentation today and all the information. Um, and we'll forward this, uh, this, this is a great, great deck, so thank you for pulling it together. Even greater how quickly you moved through it. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all for the operating budget. So thank, thank you. you. With that, thank we you, adjourned. Chair. Thank you, Chair Jawanda. Thank you, Council Member Mink. Thank, thank you, Council Member Albernaz. Have a great day. From Old Georgetown Road, Maryland 187 to Georgia Avenue, Maryland 97. Travel is slow on I-270 in the following locations. On northbound I-270, 